Hi, and welcome to episode two of the Western Canon Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Alexander Hill, and today we'll be discussing Homer's epic poem, The Iliad. Hi, and welcome again to the Western Canon Podcast. This is a show devoted to discussing all things Western Civ and to reading the great works of the Western literary tradition. And we have a great show for you today. Joining us on today's episode, we have the Oxford classicist Spencer Clavin. He's the uh, son of the great Andrew Clavin and a wonderful thinker in his own right. He'll be talking to us today about Homer's Iliad. And we also are joined by the prolific scholar and writer, Dr. Mark Bauerlein. He is professor at Emory University and author of the book, The Dumbest Generation, among other books. We'll be joined by Dr. Mark Bauerlein during our Scholar's Den segment. And of course, checking in later will be our Western canon correspondent, Gina Santiago. So we've got a hefty lineup in front of us, and we better get right into it. In episode one, we looked at the Western canon as a general phenomenon. We talked about Harold Bloom, the importance of the Western canon, and the current crisis facing the humanities. We discussed relativism and the threat that postmodernism poses to Western civilization. We discussed aesthetic approaches to evaluating literature. And we talked about canon formation and the purposes that literary canons have historically served. And lastly, Gina Santiago came on to discuss ideas that are unique to Western civilization how these ideas arose, and why they matter. Now, today we're going to begin our in-depth study of the Western canon. We're going to be close reading texts chronologically, and we're going to go through the Western literary tradition, and hopefully, uh, you know, listeners at home can follow along. We're going to start with Homer's Iliad, and that's the topic of today's episode. Homer's Iliad is an epic poem written sometime around the 7th or 8th century B.C., The poem is written in the epic style, so that would be dactylic hexameter, and it describes the events that take place in the final years of the Trojan War. Now, what is the Trojan War? Well, the Trojan War is a legendary conflict between the Trojans, obviously, uh, of Troy, and an alliance of Greek cities led by the figure of Agamemnon. The Greeks themselves believed that the Trojan War had occurred sometime in the 12th or 13th century BC. That would be during the Bronze Age. So what you had with the culture surrounding the Iliad and the Odyssey, and this is the way I like to think of it, was a little something like the way that we here in America talk about and romanticize and mythologize the Revolutionary War and the founding of our country. We have our figures like George Washington, and we have myths associated with George Washington, and the stories, some true and others not, that we tell about this period of history that are thoroughly romanticized. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Greeks were no different. Now, whoever Homer was, whether he was a lone poet or whether we're dealing with a group of poets, his work is built out of a rich tradition of unwritten oral poetry that goes back a long way and that mythologizes this storied past. And we'll talk to Spencer Clavin about the Homeric question, as it's called, a bit later. That would be the question of Homer's identity. What is clear, though, is that stories of a courageous crusade to the East and of its leader's wayward journey home had been widespread for hundreds of years before the Iliad and the Odyssey were even composed. While scholars, for the most part, agree that the city of Troy really did exist and that the Trojan War did have a basis in reality as a Greek expedition against the city of Troy, few to no scholars argue that the Homeric poems are faithfully representing what actually happened in the war. We don't believe that. Uh, the details, in other words, are, are hazy. So the actual events of the Trojan War remain an open question. However, the importance of the Iliad, and likewise Homer's centrality to the Western canon, does not remain an open question. To this day, Homer's Iliad is virtually unmatched as an expression of both the cruelty and tenderness of man, of the intensity of war, of the hero's pursuit of glory, and of the impermanence of life. These themes, Homer's themes, are universal and lasting. 
So each episode of the Western Canon podcast will include a short summary of each work that we're studying. This is mostly to jog the memory of anyone who hasn't read the book in a while, or even to fill people in who haven't read the book at all and just want to learn about the book. What I'd recommend is that every month, if you're a dedicated listener of the podcast, that you read each book in the canon along with us. This show is a monthly podcast, and so each episode, listeners can simply go to our website, www.westerncanonpodcast.com, to find out what we're reading each month and to access supplemental materials and and interviews and, and other resources. Now, Scholars suggest that Homer's epics can be categorized broadly into two different types of epic. There is kleos epic, that is, epic of glory and warfare. This obviously is embodied by the Iliad. And then there is nostos epic. Nostoi epics are epics of homecoming and of the adventures and troubles a hero goes through in the act of returning home. In other words, you essentially have war epics, kleos, and peace epics, nostos. Now, as I mentioned before, the Iliad begins nearly 10 years into the Greeks' siege of Troy. The Greeks, also known as the Achaeans, are led by Agamemnon, who is king of Mycenae. The story starts when the Greek army sacks a town allied with Troy. During the battle, the Greeks capture a pair of beautiful maidens named Chryseis and Briseis. Many of the names are uh, very similar, so that can be hard for uh, new readers. Agamemnon, who is not king of the Greeks, but their leader, decides to take Chryseis as his prize. Achilles, whose mother is a goddess and whose father is a mortal, uh, he's also the Greeks' greatest warrior, he claims the other maiden, Briseis. Now here's where the trouble begins. Chryseis' father, Chryses, is a priest of the god Apollo, who happens to be the god of plague and medicine and knowledge, among other things. So you don't want to mess with this guy. Uh, Chryses offers an enormous ransom in return for his daughter, but Agamemnon says no. So what Chryses does is he then goes and prays to Apollo, who becomes offended and sends a plague of pestilence on the Greeks. After many Greeks have died, Agamemnon finally, reluctantly, gives Chryseis back in order to end the plague. But there's a catch. He'll be taking Achilles' war prize and concubine, Briseis, as compensation for his loss. Furious at this insult, Achilles returns to his tent in the army camp and basically just refuses flat out to fight in the war anymore. In many ways, the Iliad is the story of what happens when the superhero goes on strike and refuses to fight. In a raging despair, Achilles withdraws both himself and his men, the Myrmidon warriors, from the Trojan War. In fact, Achilles is so angry and vengeful that he wants to see the Greeks destroyed, and he asks his mother, the sea nymph Thetis, to seek Zeus's help in destroying the Greeks. Zeus agrees. Now, with Zeus supporting the Trojans and Achilles refusing to fight, the Greeks begin to suffer great losses. Agamemnon, in order to gauge his army's toughness and test their resolve, gives his men a false order to give up fighting and return home. He says, let's go home, guys. We're done here. And this is a prospect that he suspects many of them will relish. Some do and fall for it, but Odysseus, Odysseus, who is the the hero of the Odyssey, and who is also considered to be the smartest and most cunning of the Greek warriors, he encourages his fellow soldiers to stay the course and keep fighting. During a brief truce in the fighting, Menelaus, who is king of Sparta, and Paris, who is prince of Troy, meet in single combat over Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. Her beauty, it is said, was known far and wide. Now would be a good time to mention that the Trojan War itself began as a battle over the beautiful Helen. Helen, who is a daughter of Zeus and the wife of Menelaus, was abducted by the ladies' man and brother of Hector, Paris, who fell in love with her while on a diplomatic mission to Sparta. So, Paris and Menelaus fight a duel, but Paris, who is a lover and not a fighter by any means, is outmatched by the deadly Menelaus. Now, normally a fight like this would mean death for the likes of Paris, but before he's killed, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, intervenes and whisks Paris away to the safety of his bedroom in Troy. 
Now the truce is broken and the battle begins anew. And despite the pleas and the misgivings of his wife Andromache, the Trojan hero Hector, who is also the brother of Paris, challenges the great Greek warrior Ajax. He is, Ajax is easily the best Greek fighter outside of Achilles, and they agree to single combat. Now, Hector is almost overcome in battle, but the fight basically ends in a tie. Now, throughout all of this, it's important to remember there are the various gods and goddesses in the background, particularly Zeus, Hera, Athena, Apollo, Poseidon, who continue to argue among themselves and to intervene in the Trojan War. For example, in both of the duels, the duel between Paris and Menelaus, as well as between Hector and Ajax, the gods are intervening. So, after a brief truce, the fighting continues again, and so many Greeks are killed that Agamemnon suggests seriously this time that his troops really do sail for home, though he's finally convinced that the fight must continue. They seek Achilles' help, but Achilles still refuses to give in to their pleas. Odysseus, Ajax, Agamemnon, Phoenix, and Nestor all make pleas to Achilles, and still Achilles is as sulky as ever. Even after he's offered riches, and even after Agamemnon belatedly offers to return Briseis to him, Achilles continues to sulk beside his ships and refuses to fight. Soon, Agamemnon, Diomedes, Odysseus, and old Nestor are all seriously wounded, and Achilles realizes that the Greeks are in danger of imminent defeat. So he sends Patroclus, his warrior companion, and some say lover, to find out who the wounded are. The Trojans push the Greeks back, forcing them to take refuge behind the ramparts that protect their ships. And the next day, several Greek commanders are wounded, and the Trojans break through the walls the Greeks had constructed to protect themselves and their ships. They advance all the way up to the boundary of the Greek camp and set fire to one of the ships. The Greeks are in trouble. They're losing. Defeat seems near, since without the ships, the army would be stranded at Troy and almost certainly destroyed. Concerned for his comrades, but still too proud to join them, Achilles agrees to a plan proposed by the wise old Nestor that will allow his beloved friend Patroclus to take his place in battle, sneakily uh, wearing his armor. Patroclus is a good warrior, and his presence on the battlefield, especially if the Trojans uh, will believe that he's Achilles in his armor, um, will help the Greeks push the Trojans away from the ships and back toward the city walls. Patroclus's valor here seems superhuman. He goes out there, he kills nine Trojans in a single charge, and then, in a moment, Apollo gets involved and strikes Patroclus with such fury that Hector, the prince of Troy, is able to catch him off guard and thrust a spear through his body. Some of the most intense fighting of the war follows in a battle for Patroclus's body. Finally, the Greeks do rescue Patroclus's corpse, and then Hector, uh, who had been with the body, steals Achilles' armor off of Patroclus, and the Greeks return to the beach to guard their ships. When Achilles discovers that Hector has killed Patroclus, his, his best friend and, and someone he grew up with, he is filled with such grief and rage that he agrees to reconcile finally with Agamemnon and rejoin the battle. His mother, Thetis, uh, who is a goddess, comes to him and advises him that it is fated that he will die if he tries to revenge Patroclus' death. But she says that if he decides to revenge his death, she'll outfit him with a new suit of armor made by the god Hephaestus, which she presents to him the next morning. Achilles then rides out to battle at the head of the Greek army. The choice Achilles makes in the Iliad is ultimately this. He decides to defy certain death and the Trojans in an attempt to punish them for what they did to Patroclus. Achilles is also deeply angry at himself because he realizes that he too is responsible for Patroclus' death. When Achilles returns to the fighting, the Trojan army seeing him in the flesh, uh, they flee in terror, and Achilles cuts down every Trojan he sees. Strengthened by his rage, he even fights the god of the river Xanthus, who is angry that Achilles has caused so many corpses to fall in his streams. Finally, 
Achilles confronts Hector outside the walls of Troy. Hector, the one who killed his beloved friend Patroclus. Now, Hector uh, is a hero and a great fighter, but he's, he's no less human than the others. Hector flees, and Achilles chases Hector around the city's periphery three times. But the goddess Athena finally tricks Hector into turning around and fighting Achilles. In a dramatic duel, Achilles kills Hector. He then lashes the body to the back of his chariot and drags it across the battlefield to the Greek camp. Upon Achilles' arrival, the triumphant Greeks celebrate Patroclus' funeral with a long series of athletic games in his honor. But Achilles is not done with Hector's body. Each day for the next nine days, Achilles defiles Hector's body. Hector's parents are so grieved at the barbaric treatment of their son's corpse that King Priam, in one of the most moving scenes in the poem, goes to Achilles and begs for his son's body. Zeus sends the god Hermes to escort King Priam into the Greek camp. And Priam tearfully pleads with Achilles to take pity on a father bereft of his son and to return Hector's body. He even invokes the memory of Achilles' own father, Peleus. Achilles is moved by this plea and by the memory of his own father, and so he agrees to cleanse and return Hector's body. Hector's body is given the appropriate cremation rites, and then with mourning and weeping for the noble warrior, the Trojans place his remains in a golden casket and place it in a burial barrow. Both sides agree to a temporary truce, and the Iliad ends with Hector's funeral during a 12-day truce granted by Achilles. Now, there are many themes present in the Iliad that we could talk about, uh, one of which being the theme of rage. In fact, the first word of the Iliad is anger or rage. It depends on who's translating. For this episode, I'm using Robert Fitzgerald's 1974 translation, so I'll read the first lines from his translation. Anger, be now your song, immortal one. Achilles' anger, doomed and ruinous, that caused the Achaeans loss on bitter loss, and crowded brave souls into the undergloom, leaving so many dead men. Carry on for dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was done. Be it when the two men first contending broke with one another, the Lord Marshal Agamemnon, Atreus' son, and Prince Achilles. Now, That's obviously very beautiful, Uh, but to compare, let's look at the Fagel's version. Rage, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carry on, feasts for the dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was moving towards its end. Begin, muse, when the two first broke and clashed. Agamemnon, lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. Now you'll notice that those two passages that I just read uh, were very similar in many ways, uh, but they were also very different. It's always interesting, I find, to compare different translations from different translators in different periods to see how differing interpretations can yield entirely different meanings and effects for the reader. For example, in the Fitzgerald version, it is said that Achilles' anger is ruinous, causing loss upon loss, and crowding men into the undergloom, leaving so many dead. Here the reader gets a very possessive sense of Achilles' selfish anger, an anger that is so destructive that it essentially hurls men to their deaths into the dark undergloom. But if you look at Fagel's 1990 version, you get something of a different picture. The word rage is used, which is more fashionable uh, now when we're speaking of the Iliad. But Fagel's doesn't say Achilles' rage. He just starts by saying rage. And then he says the rage of Achilles, as if all men possess this thing called rage, and Achilles is just 
you know, exercising or participating in his. Fagel says that this is a rage that cost the Achaeans and hurled men to their doom. The sense here is that not Achilles, but an emotion or a larger force is at work, and that Achilles has become swept up in it. Now, I could ramble all day about the various themes and meanings in the Iliad, but instead I've got a cadre of guest experts who know much more about the Iliad than I do, so I'd like to now introduce the young classicist Spencer Clavin. We're very excited to have him on this show. Spencer is a postgraduate at Oxford who specializes in Greek literature and classics. Um, Specifically, uh, Spencer studies ancient Greek music and the sung performance of these ancient Greek classics that we tend to forget were originally composed as songs. Uh, Spencer will be talking about glory and honor, uh, Homer's centrality to the Western canon, the Homeric question, diction and translation, and even homosexuality in Greek life. So welcome to the show, Spencer. Hi, Jordan. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you being on this brand new show. Um, and I, wanna, I want to start by explaining how sort of you came into my radar um, I was looking for uh, some commentary about this question of what is the West? How do we define it, especially after um, Trump's polling speech and everything that happened in Charlottesville? It all got us to thinking, what is the West? How do we define it? What's special about the Western intellectual tradition? And I came across a discussion with you and a panel of, of some others on the Michael Knowles show. It was called what is the West? And you were so incredibly insightful and eloquent and well-versed. I said to my co-collaborator, Gina, we've got to get this guy on the show. And here you are. And we're really, really happy to have you. Well, the pleasure is all mine. I'm really honored uh, that you wanted to have me on. And it's very exciting to be a part of this project at its infancy. You know, it's just, it's such an exciting and, and I think necessary project to have on their waves at the moment. So I'm, I'm really glad that you asked me on. Thanks again. So if, if texts like the Iliad are not just dusty excavations uh, from history, um, why, why do they matter? And let's, let's zone in specifically on the Iliad. Why does the Iliad matter? And in what way is it central to the Western canon or to the great conversation of history? Yeah, well, certainly from a very kind of basic standpoint, it's almost impossible to talk about the canon without placing Homer in a, in a pretty central position there. Certainly a Western literary canon is going to make very serious mention of Homer for the simple reason, if nothing else, that Homer is really the first in many ways. He's the earliest poem that comes down to us in this intact form from classical antiquity, classical antiquity being one of the two great centers of, of the Western tradition, you know, sort of the, the Greco-Roman tradition and the Judeo-Christian tradition, which, which eventually meet. Um, that's really to beg the question, though, because you just have to ask again, why is it that this is the text that has been preserved over this long period of time? Why did it matter so much that it's been written down and copied again and again and again until it reaches us. Um, why not any of the other? I mean, we know there were other epics. There's a, you know, this, this, the Cypria, the epic cycle, the, all of these um, epics that, that don't come down to us in this complete form. Why this one? Um, and so your question is, is doubly apt then. I mean, my own answer is, is fairly simple, although it's not one that you might get from everyone. I actually believe that poetry and literature more broadly has a purpose and a point. Um, I believe that the purpose of it is to accomplish the communication of the human experience and that regardless of your individual preferences for this author or that, poetry can actually be evaluated on the basis of its success in that project. Um, what I mean by it is this, look, I can tell you certain facts about my day to day, like what I had for breakfast. And that's quite easy. I'm, I'm able to use normal communicative language to tell you that. What I can't tell you in quite the same kinds of words is what it was like for me to eat that breakfast, what it tasted like, how I felt when I was eating it, um, what sort of associations it, it drew up for me. Everything that a philosopher might call the qualia of my experience, right? the quality of what it was like to be me eating that breakfast mm-hmm. in that moment. Um, that's what poetry and literature are there to 
preserve and to communicate. When you hear people talk about that sort of thing in ordinary conversation, they very quickly lapse into a kind of quasi-poetic speech, something like metaphor or, or imagery, right? You'll hear someone say, well, I asked this girl out and it was like my heart was pounding against the ribs of my chest. And then she said, yes, it was like I was floating on a cloud, right? That, that's where we, we sort of break the bonds of literal speech and to move into imagery, metaphor, etc. That's a very, very small motion towards what poetry and literature aim to accomplish in full, is to record some aspect of the human experience. For me, when a poem survives, as the Iliad has done, and not only survives, but, but thrives right at the heart of a long and storied tradition, the chances are good that it has succeeded at doing that thing in some very basic way. That's what I think the Iliad does and why it's centrally why it's important. It communicates and preserves aspects of being a human that are urgent, chronic, core to the human experience. What it's like to be at war and fear for your life. What it is like to do stupid things out of rage or love. What it's like to chase after a, a girl to the destruction of your entire city, right? These, these are things that are kind of etched into this poem and have been of huge consequence ever since they were first sung or spoken. Um, now, once you sort of make that claim, you can make a second claim, which is that you're actually, it's actually capable to progress in, in the composition of literature. It's, it's not impossible to assert a sort of upward trajectory or at least an ongoing conversation in literary history. Um, and then you can treat the Iliad as a kind of beginning of an ongoing record, which is really what it has become, you know, that ever since the Iliad was composed, it's been used as essentially the urtext, these kind of original uh, poem from which other authors will borrow and rework and interpret. And that's part of the process of this kind of literary conversation. Uh, the, the great uh, tragedian, the Greek dramatist Aeschylus, is rumored to have said that all of his work was like slices from the banquet of Homer. And I think that, you know, almost any great mind of, of Western literature could have said the same thing. Um, we say the same thing about Shakespeare all the sure, time. Right. Well, it, absolutely. Exactly. And Shakespeare in many ways fills the same role that Homer did in our culture, um, fills the same role in our culture that Homer did in, in ancient Greek culture. Um, that raises then the next kind of avenue of, of question, which is what did Homer mean to the Greeks uh, that, that they felt the need to, to preserve him and, and keep him alive. One thing that, people might not immediately think about is the fact that whereas we have texts in our society like the Bible and the Torah that serve as definitive scriptural authorities, there's, there's not a, a Greek scripture for ancient Greek religion. Um, and so in many ways, the Iliad and the Odyssey serve that purpose in Greek society. In addition to being these very powerful poetic texts, they're also cultural unifiers. They're memorized in school. They're cited by philosophers to prove points. They're argued over. They're, um, they're recited and, and, and you know, reinterpreted over and over again. Uh, and so that accounts for some of their centrality in the West as well, that, that these are standing at the center of what becomes one of the great original cultures of the West. So you talked about the idea that, that art and, and literature act as a kind of record of, of what it's like to be a, a person and how that's important. Um, even if we're progressing, you talked about poetry as a way of describing uh, experience and emotion. Uh, and this is what is to me so sad about this modern tendency of judging works of literature on the basis of whether or not they live up to our the progressive 21st century standards of equity and propriety. Do these works meet our diversity standards? Do, do the characters in the uh, Iliad treat women the way that we, 2,000 years later, wish they would have? Um, this seems to me to be a kind of very narrow way to read literature. We could call it the hindsight is 2020 chauvinism. Um, it seems to me instead that if we care about diversity, we should be diving headfirst into 
the diverse ways of being and thinking and loving that have existed throughout history and maybe looking at these works of literature through a humanistic lens, like what can this text say to me that is universal to the human experience? You know, you said uh, going to war for love and doing stupid things and, and what can it tell me about well-being? Uh, and on the contrary, what what about it is alien and strange? That's kind of what I want to know too. What about it is is weird and sort of otherworldly? You know, I found the Iliad to be a perfect example of what is both hauntingly familiar um, mm-hmm. in terms of conflict and making these mistakes and, and infidelity. You know, if, if you're a conservative, maybe you love the fact that the Iliad is a meditation on why infidelity is so disastrous. And <laughs> if, maybe if you're, if you're more of a, um, if you're more, if you're on the left, it, or if you're a libertarian, it's about the dangers of war, the havoc of war. Um, I wonder if you could help me unpack the mindset of an ancient Greek warrior, especially looking at these concepts like Time and and Kleos. What do they mean, and uh, you know how are they important for better understanding the human beings in the Iliad? Yeah, no, you, you bring up a really interesting point. That Brecht, who is a, a playwright and scholar, uh, for whom I don't have much admiration does have this really interesting concept, which I'm going to totally slaughter in German, but it's something like the Fremdungseffekt, which is the alienation effect. Yeah. I would not have wanted to go to one of his plays. Yeah, I know. Right. It's (laughs) just for that, for that word alone. Um, But it's essentially, you know, in in some ways it, it has a lot to do with what you're talking about, that one of the things art is good at doing is presenting to us something that we do every day without thinking, but presenting it to us as strange or alien or foreign. Um, and recognizing in the Greeks both our own sort of selves, but also people very, very different from us is is a kind of self-knowledge. It's a way of of coming to know ourselves by saying, gosh, you know, I too have done something stupid for love, but because it looked so familiar to me, I didn't even really see it. I didn't recognize that experience or wasn't aware of it. Now that I see it in this completely separate and other context, I can really look at it with a kind of distance and and appreciate and think about it. Now, when you come down to questions of reading the Iliad in this way, what you said is really really apt, right? That each person is going to see something different in this poem, and that's part of its endlessly generative power, is that it it does speak to people on where they live. And just like Shakespeare, Homer has a tendency to bring out of us interpretations that say a lot about us as well as about Homer. Um, in many ways, the thing that you read as kind of the core of the Iliad is, is going to tell you a lot about what you read about in, in terms of the core of yourself. Um, let's think then about the question of, of Kleos or, or, or Time, right? Um, broadly speaking, this parcel of Greek words, Time, Kleos, Kudos is another one, um, have to do with the concept of, of glory or, or honor. Um, it's a little more complicated than that in the sense that, that you know, Kleos is really the, 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 the central that survives as, as a focus of, of interpretation and, and importance in, in the Iliad. Uh, Kleos means a lot of things. It can mean rumor or root. Um, it's it's contrasted, actually, at one point in the Iliad with true knowledge. Um, we, we're told in the catalog of ships that we only have Kleos, we only have rumor, and we need muses to tell us, to set the record straight and tell us the truth. Uh, but included in that parcel of concept is also just sort of what people say, yeah, what people are talking about and what's on people's minds. And then from there you get to the idea essentially of, well, what's on people's minds about you? Yeah, what is your class? What are, what are people remembering about your life and your uh, experience and the way that you acted in the world? Now, it's further complicated by the fact that for the ancient Greeks, for an Greek mindset of, of um, heroism in archaic Greece, Kleos is the closest thing you're going to have to like that. It gets, you know, Greek metaphysics, Greek religion gets tricky, but basically we can we can think about the actual spirit of a person being almost entirely snuffed out upon that person's death. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, and the Iliad especially, which is a poem full of war and carnage, right? People get cut down and their souls sort of drain out of them and end up in this 
weird, shadowy limbo underworld where it's not even clear if they really exist in the way that we hope that will exist after death, many of us. Um, Achilles, the, the central figure of the Iliad, shows up again in the Odyssey, the other great Homeric epic. And he's, he's in this shadowy underworld having died. And he says to Odysseus, you know, I would rather be a slave on earth alive than be the king of this underworld land. So really, you know, th- there's a strong sense that being alive is awesome and powerful and vibrant and real and robust and being dead is empty and meaningless and potentially not even real. Um, Given all of that fact, the thing that you fight for or trade in your death for in many cases is your kleos. That's the closest thing you're going to get to immortality is that after you die, people will talk about you. They will tell stories about you and you will live on in collective memory. I mean, this is, this has become a cliche, but in, in Homer, it's a much more powerful idea. The poem, the Iliad repeatedly acknowledges, um, this sense of what in Greek we call is called the esomenoi, those who will be after us, those who are going to be. And hugely centrally important in the poem is what are the esomenoi going to know? What are those who are about to come after us going to talk about? Because that's going to be the way that we continue to live. And of course, there's a there's another level to that, which is to say that what are the, what are they going to know? They're going to know what's in this poem. This poem is a kind of chaos, right? Homer is aware of himself, I think, uh, or the Homeric poets are aware of themselves uh, as preservers of, of Kleos. And in, in many ways, what the characters in the poem are fighting to preserve is themselves in the poem. Um, all of that, the central conflict of the poem, I think, takes on a, a new and much more understandable light. This is this is a, a moment really of, of foreignness for us. It's quite a commonplace at this point to say that this the central sort of narrative or or complication of the poem is Achilles, the greatest Greek hero, acting like a bit of a brat. People are really hard on Achilles because essentially what happens is he gets snubbed. Um, The the king, one of the sort of central kings of the Greek army, loses his own war prize. Agamemnon. Exactly. I'm talking about Agamemnon. Um, Agamemnon has taken as his own concubine the daughter of a priest of Apollo. Chryseis. Exactly. Chryseis. This is a bad move. Um, When you take a priest's daughter as your sex slave, basically, you end up being slaughtered by the god whom that priest serves. And that's exactly what happens. You know, bad move, Agamemnon. So, um... Chryseis' father calls down holy hell upon the Greeks, uh, which means that Chryseis has to be given back in order for the war effort to continue. Agamemnon can't really take this as like a thing that might happen to him, the great king of you know, the great leader of the Greek army, and by consequence, he seals Chryseis, who is Ag- who is Achilles' war prize, right? That serving the same function, he's, he's taken this concubine Chryseis. There's some suggestion that uh, Achilles and Chryseis might actually have a a very powerful romantic relationship, but that's actually rather neither here nor there. What what matters is that this prize, this uh, concubine, has been stolen from Achilles. Now there are many things about this that are potentially abhorrent to to a modern sensibility, and in the way that you were indicating, we don't advocate at this point that women be treated like property, for one thing. Um, Besides which, Homer says at the outset that Achilles' rage over this episode is the murderer of thousands of Greeks. Achilles is so infuriated about this that he basically pouts in a corner on the shore for a climactic set of days in the war against Troy. And that's, that's the story of the Iliad, is what happens when Achilles is basically absent from the battle. He's he's the most powerful Greek warrior, and he's having a hissy fit, and everyone is dying because of him. Now, th- there's no inroad for us to understanding that uh, that hissy fit, except the concept of Kleos. What Achilles reminds us of several times, and what we sort of are, I think, expected to know already coming to the poem, is that Achilles has been offered a choice by fate. He can either die young in this war and win immortal Kleos, or he can have another sort of central concept in Homer, which is Nostos. Um, Nostos means something like homecoming. Homecoming, yeah. 
That's right. And and that's what Odysseus is hunting after, right? right? In, the, in the Odyssey, in, yeah. In the Odyssey, yeah. Odysseus wants Nostos. Um, Achilles, if he if he chooses Nostos, can have a long, healthy, full life, but no Kleos. If he chooses not Nostos, he gets death and Kleos. And I that's can't... The- I can't stop thinking about this dilemma that Achilles faces. You know, he he receives his fate. He can either go home and live out his days, happy man, loving family, but he'll possess less Kleos, um, or he can stay at war and die, and and then he's going to earn this kind of abstract immortality uh, through Kleos. But mm-hmm. it's it's weird. You, I, I don't know if this is just my modern sensibility speaking, but you kind of have to take a leap of faith. Like, how is this Kleos going to benefit me after I'm dead? Like, one's right. Kleos doesn't prevent one's consciousness from being extinguished, does it? Um, yeah. So it, it does run counter to what most modern people seek in life. You know, most of us will gladly forego what the Greeks called Kleos in order to live to an old age and in order to, to be happy with a loved one. And we aren't as tempted by Kleos today, are we? Or most of us. uh, Yeah, you make a really good point. Not only does this prospect not appeal from a modern standpoint, um, Homer acknowledges, as as we've already kind of discussed, right? Homer acknowledges that Achilles' choice is kind of unsatisfactory. And in fact, when he finds himself in the underworld, immortal though his Kleos may be, he's kind of regretting his decision. Um, This you're right, has to do with a kind of central urge in, I think, in the, in the human spirit um, that's really answered by the Christian idea of a personal resurrection, right? We want to have the sense that what persists after our bodily death will be us as individuals. We're not even really content, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not content with the idea of being kind of dissipated out into a great cosmic all that, you know, somehow we will dissolve and come go back to the the bosom of, of divinity whence we came. We kind of want to be us. And this is something, I mean, the Greeks are vexed about this question just as much as we are. Uh, Lucretius, who is the uh, the poet who writes a kind of Latin interpretation of Epicurean philosophy, records a set of Epicurean doctrines, which basically tells us, no, you dissolve. Your spirit is made of atoms, which are physical particles. After you die, you will be just like before you were born. You will not have a consciousness. And so there's an awareness of this urgent and impending doom that that meets all people. Um, this is something that, you know, a, a book that I've recently been really loving is, is called After Virtue by Alistair uh, McIntyre. And he's really good about this, about the sense that not only is the Homeric world sort of constructed as a series of, of trials and conflicts and, and battles, but there's a very tragic and sort of irreducible acknowledgement in Homer that the outcome of that, of those trials, is death. That winning and losing are ultimately the same, and there is no satisfactory recompense for the fact that you will lose your life in battle. Now, that's, I think, a, uh, at the heart of what has been called the tragic sensibility of Nixon. Uh, for me, in, in my own sort of personal history of Western culture, that's one of the great needs and yearnings and longings in Greco-Roman society that, that, that Judeo-Christian tradition serves when the two meet. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, Kleos is not an appealing uh, reward for us, or even really a satisfactory reward for the Greeks. And yet they were striving after it wholeheartedly. It was all about Kleos. We're, we are a Timae-focused culture. Um, mm. They were striving after Kleos. Mm. Right. Um, that's a, that's an interesting distinction, you know. And these these words are um, both very powerful in the sense that they challenge us to kind of think in in terms of new concepts, and also diff- slippery and difficult to get a hand on. But you, you're right. Um, Time often, I think, refers to something that you might receive in your lifetime. You might hear about your Time in the present moment. Um, you might be motivated by it to seek a political office, for example, or uh, any number of other things, you know, work to win the Olympic Games. Um, it's, a, it's a source of motivation that, that Aristotle later on, much, much later than Homer, is, is quite concerned with um, because he thinks that it is sort of a secondary or a degraded goal that detracts from the goal of doing the good thing for the sake of the good. Um, and Aristotle himself is is poignantly aware of the fact that democratic societies or sort of 
uh, populist societies tend to, uh, to democracy, to the ceaseless striving after, after reputation and honor. Um, that's already a very different thing. And as you say, I mean, Kleos is related because it has to do with your reputation and what people say about you. Um, but it does put the horizon of your calculation much further ahead, which, which, which makes for certain, certain differences. Um, it's, it's true that, you know, hunting for something because of the team a attached to it is an ultimately destructive mode of life as Aristotle very cogently argues in the, in the Nicomachean ethics. Um, that said, it's a very human impulse. It's something that, you know, without a sense of a satisfactory sense of, of post death reward, uh, of some kind, it, it's easy. It's easy to sort of hunt after that as something that is at least satisfying in, in the present moment. So speaking of Homer and the, the kinds of conversations that we're still having today about him, scholars right. seem to generally agree that Homer's works were the end result of a long tradition of uh, unwritten oral poetry. Um, mm. And yet it seems, um, and I've talked to a couple of people on this, that we're still clueless of Homer's true identity. Um, mm. Do you, Spencer, take a side on the Homeric question? Is this a contentious <laughs> issue at Oxford? I would not dare. I would not dare to take an issue on the side on the issue of the Homeric question for the following reason. Um, so you you were right. There is a general consensus that what we're looking at is the consequence of an oral tradition. It would be very very difficult to argue anything other than that. Um, that of course raises this this question: Who is Homer? Right? Who composes the Iliad and the Odyssey? Can you even compose orally compose a poem of twenty four books, each of hundreds of lines long, each hundreds of lines long? Um, that question has been effectively answered in the, the tentative affirmative. There is uh, some very foundational work that was done in the twentieth century by uh, Lord and Albert Lord and Milman Perry um, by studying cultures in the former Yugoslavia, which which preserve great long strings of in the moment composition uh, through a number of oral techniques that do enable oral poets to compose in the way that you might potentially generate the Iliad and the Odyssey. So it's not a, a totally off the table that we're looking at a singular genius composing both of these texts. Um, but we're, it's also obviously completely not off the table that we're looking at multiple poets, innumerable poets, really, in a kind in a prehistoric era. Um, we we don't locate the composition of these poems any later than the seventh century BC, probably earlier than that. Um, and we we might be looking at just a bunch of different singers with a bunch of different stories that only over a, the long process of time get compiled into one thing. Um, this boils down to, in very simplistic terms, what's been called the argument between the analysts and the Unitarians in Homeric scholarship. Um, analysts want essentially to say that there's some potentially recoverable original set of oral poems at the very bare minimum written by two authors, one of the Iliad and one of the Odyssey. Now, that's an ancient viewpoint. There are ancient, there were ancient scholars uh, called hoikoris dantes, who, those who separate. And those who separated were <laughs> wanted to say that these are two different, different uh, poets. But, of course, it gets much more complicated than that in that modern scholars also want multiple poems within each poem. And basically to say that these are local, uh, shorter epics that are then combined into one thing. Uh, there's a scholar uh, named, named Wolf, uh, which I'm sure, again, I'm, I'm butchering, um, who sort of initiates this tradition. And in many ways, it sort of peaks with the great German philologist Willemowitz, um, who is famous for arguing that the Odyssey is, is three separate poems that are then compiled by a Bearbeiter, an, an editor. Um, and that gives rise to this idea of an A poet and a B poet, right? The, the poems, the poets who originally are singing out in the world in front of audiences, and then the poet who is kind of taking that tradition and, and arranging it into some coherent material. Unitarians, on the other hand, want to tell you, well, look, look at the magisterial structure of this work. Look at its sort of coherence from beginning to end. Surely we're dealing at least with some, some single mind composing a single text. Um, frankly, the, the, the short answer to this question is we do not know. We don't know if there was one Homer or many. Um, my own, if I had, if I were a betting man, I would put money on some sort of combination of the two theses. I do think that there is a real sense of unity and artistry in the poem. Um, at the same time, it seems 
abundantly clear that you were at least dealing with local variations. We even have records of certain local variations. Um, and that probably there's a there's a story behind before Homer to where some of this text comes from, um, that Homer, as part of in the inheritor of the tradition, would have certainly used and abused and reused. Um, whatever else you might say about that, there is decent evidence for what's been called the Pisistratid recension. So this is during the sixth century BC, um, the Athenian tyrant or, or king, uh, Pisistratus, institutes the Panhellenic Olympic Festival. So this is a kind of big gathering of everyone in Greece, all the different tribes and cultures and communities. Um, and seemingly as part of that project, as part of the project of kind of unifying a number of different uh, societal strands under Pisistratid rule, there is commissioned a written official text, uh, Plutarch, it gives us reason to believe of these two epics. Um, that text is not what is still not what we would think of when we think of reading our opening our books and reading Homer. Um, it's more like a kind of script for bards to to read off of or to learn from and then perform um, in real time. So these are these are profoundly oral texts. And certainly by the time of the Pisistratid recension, they take on a unity and have an official quality. And are also, it's really important to remember that they're, they're meant to be Panhellenic. There are records of annoyances among scholars. Aristotle records a, an annoyance that one line in the catalog of ships, you know, that kind of interminably long list of all, all yeah. the ships that yeah. sail Troy... Um, that was the first us, moment that I thought, I don't know if I can read this book. I don't know if I'm going to make I, it through this book. <laughs> you and like literally every person who has ever read has exactly that reaction. It's it's just it's just utterly dull for us. But that sort of speaks to the difference between what we're doing with this text and what the Greeks were. I mean, you can well imagine that if you're a local bard and you're performing in wherever it is, Megara or at Athens, and you have an audience of people who come from these places. places. That's right, right, exactly. It's like the calling out the roster on a baseball That's team. That's our ship. Know? That's our ship. Exactly, right. If they're, you know, oh, there's the guy who plays center field, and he's from my hometown, you know. Wild riotous applause, I'm sure. But anyway, there's, there's a suggestion that one of those lines might have been interpolated, shoved in later, to um, bolster a claim on the part of Athens over... I think it's Samos, um, and and it's meant to bolster it over the claim of, of Megara, and so the people get very annoyed about this because these are kind of meant to be cultural unifiers, things that we can all come together on, meant for everybody. Certainly, by the time of the sixth century BC onward, that's that's what we're looking at. Um, but do I do I think there was a Homer? Tentatively, yes, but I I wouldn't uh, stake my life on it. So how do we get our information about when uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey were written? Was it cultural context from scholars actually reading the text and, and looking at the details? Or do we have ancient historians in Greece telling us this is when it was written? And also, I, I wanted to ask you about this because you would know better than I would. I've heard that the Iliad is, is about the 12th century B.C., it's written, mm. it's written in the 7th century, but it's about events that happened in the 12th century. Is that? So that's roughly correct. It's written at no later than the 7th century, or rather not written, but composed no later than the, the 7th century, um, possibly the 8th. Um, but it is about a heroic past. And so that's a, actually a central feature of, of Homer. He's I'll talk about Homer as if as if they're a person, just for convenience sake. Homer is um, not afraid to speak anachronistically. He inserts methods of technologies of war that probably wouldn't have been around in the 12th century BC during the era that he's he's speaking about, and that contributes to an important feature of sort of ancient discourse around this poem, which is that there's about as much uh, lack of knowledge in classical antiquity as we have today. We are not really in a better or worse standpoint than the ancients were on this point. The sure. question, for example, sure. which was hugely important um, in modernity of, was there a Troy? Where was Troy? Um, what actually happened that is being sort of poeticized or mythologized in Homer? All of those questions are 
up for debate in antiquity as well. There's a, a Greek scholar, Demetrius, who is who is very vexed about finding the location of Troy. And it's clear that his knowledge is not much better than ours. So that speaks to your own question of how do we find out about this stuff? A little bit of both. We, we do our own uh, research. And obviously, you know, there are a number of different approaches that you might take to doing that. One very famous one is that of Heinrich Schliemann, who, whose goal was to excavate Troy, to find the archaeological remains of Troy. Um, but we also listen to what the ancients have to say and the, to the arguments, to the records that they give us. Those get, by and large, they get better over time, of course. Um, but we also have to contend with the fact that the idea of preserving factual history is in flux in the ancient world. The, you, it's perfectly acceptable in many cases to invent stories that we know are plainly mythology, mythological about Homer and present them as kind of part of an, a biography of Homer. I mean, one obvious example is Homer was the son of Apollo and a muse. That's a tradition that comes down to us in a, in a kind of biographical mode. But since we don't believe in Apollo, or the muses as actual entities who might give birth to humans, we know that that, that has to be false. Um, the Greek historian Thucydides, who comes after Herodotus, who's sort of sometimes known as the, the father of history, Thucydides um, accuses many of his predecessors of being muthologoi, uh, tellers of myths, tellers of stories. And these disciplines that we think of as very distinct, right? Telling history, telling, writing poetry, writing fiction, uh, creating myths. These are very closely bound up with one another. Some of the first texts to record historical fact were probably poetic texts, which are also some of the first texts to weave cultural narrative, tell stories, etc. Um, so it's a very delicate job that we face with our own sort of ideas about true and false and about narrative versus um, versus factual accounts of things. Um, Herodotus himself, in his opening uh, the opening of his history essentially tells us that what he's going to do is preserve the color of the deeds of men. That's a very different project than Thucydides, which is to tell you what happened. And so, right. um, you know, we're, we are looking at a tradition of people who think somewhat differently than we do about, about telling the truth and, and preserving history. Um, and so that again, further complicates our job when we're trying to ask you know, when were these written, by whom, for whom, etc. But do we know that the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed sometime after the Greek alphabet was invented? Ah, that, this is another vexed question on which I definitely wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hazard a, an authoritative opinion. Um, there's a moment in the Iliad in which a messenger is sent by the Greeks, I think it is, with Seimata. Um, or rather, it's not by the Greeks. It's, it's a story told about a messenger being sent to Seimata. Uh, now, in Greek, a Seima is a sign, uh, but it's also the word that eventually gets used for semantic language. Um, it's the same root. And so there are questions about whether that indicates uh, an awareness on Homer's part of the existence of a written language, um, which wouldn't change the oral nature of the poem so much as the context in which that oral nature is taking place, that this is a world in which you could write things down, even if these poems aren't written. Um, other people will argue that the same are pictographs or not. They're, they are not literary uh, symbols, that Homer was a was completely naive to all questions of, of writing and compose his poems orally because that was how you compose poems. Um, what is certainly true is that poems are oral in, in the Greek world in the sense of being fundamentally sort of sound productions of voice and sound um, until very, very late in, in Greek history. It's really after what we think of as the height of the classical period, which is really the 5th century in Athens, the 5th century BC, um, that we start to, at the Library of Alexandria and in the Hellenistic period after Alexander uh, of Macedon's death, that's when we start to see writing becoming a central technology for composing and communicating poetry. So whatever whatever's happening, the, the poetic tradition in the ancient Greek world remains oral long after we might sort of expect it to become oh. written. Which is, which is really something we don't think about a lot. 
I was struck by the diction. I was struck by the amazing, uh, evocative uh, nature of the prose, the diction. Who do I give credit to? Do I give credit to the translator? Um, do I should I give credit to Homer for the ideas and for the stories and for his sense of history and and myth and tradition, or or when I'm when I am lingering over a sentence and just marveling over you chose the exact right word to convey emotion and experience. Is that Homer? Is that Fagels? Is that Fitzpatrick? What a great question. Uh, and so, so difficult to answer. It is, a, it is a long question in literary studies, the question of translation theory, right? Um, obviously, when we read a, an English translation of the Odyssey, we are not, or the Iliad, we are not reading or hearing the sounds of Homer's words as they would have been heard and recited by the Greeks. Um, maybe a good place to start in answering that question is with the debate conducted between uh, Matthew Arnold, the famous uh, English poet and, and professor of poetry at Oxford, um, and one of his predecessors in, in translating Homer, a man named Newman. Um, there is a long series of lectures and on the part of Arnold and responses on the part of Newman basically arguing over what's your job as a translator? What are you trying to give to the reader? Um, and it's interestingly kind of bound up with the advent of uh, classical poetry as a feature of, of world literature rather than the study of classics. Classics is becoming less central as a part of the education of a uh, Western mind and Homer is being shifted into the world of the history of the canon writ large, which is sort of relevant to, you know, this very podcast. Um, because of that, translations of Homer are becoming important. It's no longer the case that in order to appreciate Homer, it's feasible to demand that one learn Greek and read Greek. Um, now, Newman, I believe it is, has a sense of Homer as the kind of noble savage in the sense that he was a childlike pre-cultural sage and his experience of encountering Homeric poetry is, is an experience of alienation. It's an experience of a sort of primitive diction uh, and a simplicity, which he has translated with the English bard uh, verse with kind of with the, with the verse of balladeers. Um, and, and that gives a very particular and kind of homespun sound to his translation. Matthew Arnold disagrees entirely and essentially argues that what you're hearing in Homer when you encounter, encounter the original Greek is uh, a robust, firm, manly, simple voice. Uh, and that that's the kind of central aesthetic experience of reading Homer. And so translations should reflect that. Now, both parties in this debate agree that the point of translation is in some sense to preserve the aesthetic and qualitative experience of reading Homer's original words. Uh, and so Fitzgerald, uh, Lattimore, Fagels most recently, their translations, I think, in many cases, aim to accomplish that goal, which is to say to get you not the original words of the poem, but at least the original experience of, of reading the poem. Um, now, ultimately, that's almost an impossible project, that every word in every language is slightly different from every other word, and words in between different languages are different from one another. On top of that, Homeric poetry is written in a language that has very, very different structural and stylistic possibilities than ours. For one thing, as I think we said at the beginning, Greek is a tonal language. It has three pitch accents that dictate where the voice is, whether the voice is supposed to rise and fall. Uh, and whereas in English, meter works with stress. So if you take, for example, Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, right, it little profits that an idle king, this is iambic pentameter with, with force put upon each uh, stressed syllable. In Greek, what you have is a, um, a kind of structure of duration. So long syllables actually last longer, and short syllables are pronounced more quickly. So the first line of the Iliad, men in the dia pelea dio achilleos. Yeah, these are these. This is a kind of musical rhythm. And so when you put that into English, you have to really account for the fact that an English reader isn't going to automatically read the words in those ways. All of that being said, there is a sort of fundamental thing that you can do, which is 
try as best as possible to find the English word that reflects what, what you're very rightly describing, which is Homer's pinpoint accuracy for finding the, the word that is going to tell you exactly what's happening. He has an immensely rich and complicated vocabulary for what the Greeks might have called enargeia, the vividness of hearing or seeing a battle, um, communicating it to you as if you were sensorily there. And I think that some of the more modern translations that we have do this very well. Um, I like to think of, of Homeric verse, which is in dactylic hexameter as hoof beats and heartbeats. You get this kind of da 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 and there's a real sense of of onward drive and forward motion that I think any good translation would have to to capture. But who do you give credit to? I think ultimately Homer, uh, but it's always going to be a kind of collaboration between Homer and the and the translator who's hopefully aiming to give you as faithfully as possible what what Homer gives you. So lastly, um, I have to address this mostly because I'm curious and and also because I've been given the impression that that this is a settled matter, um, whereas I thought there was still some debate about this. Were Achilles and Patroclus lovers? Is there any <laughs> evidence for this? I I didn't come across any in the Iliad. Um, there didn't seem to be any in the Iliad itself. And although I, I know that homosexuality is said to have been a staple of ancient Greek life, uh, whether or not we'd want to even call it homosexuality, were they lovers and does it matter? And is this just revisionist PC, you know, you know, gobbledygook? <laughs> Did they or didn't they, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> talk about questions that have been debated since the composition of, of the Homeric poems. Uh, this is a this question is, is particularly live in ancient scholarship because, you know, sex is always interesting. Uh, now, here are some things that we know. It's true, as you say, that there is no direct evidence in the Iliad uh, for a sexual relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. Patroclus is uh, the sort of closest friend and also kind of, in some senses, guardian and confidant. Uh, he grew up with him, right? He grew up with yeah. Achilles. That's right, right. That's right. And one thing that people forget is that um, Patroclus is older. Achilles is, is younger than Patroclus. He's not his kind of boy. Um, that is what one of the things that complicates the later debate, because essentially in in classical antiquity, in fifth century BC Athens, we have a very storied record of homosexual practice between older men and younger boys. Um, the kind of thing that we might actually re react against on a number of, of levels, depending on our various sensibilities, one of which is, is age discrepancy. Uh, the term that's been used is, is pederasty, right? That, that you have a kind of older guiding man and a younger boy as a sort of initiative uh, right um, engaging in, in sexual practice. In that context, um, there is a kind of dance between what's licit and what's illicit. Um, this is this is a widespread phenomenon. This is something that is uh, normalized and in, in many instances spoken about quite openly. But there is also an impulse to kind of pretty it up and decorate it with more sort of elegant language, like saying that this is a, a purely intellectual relationship or something along those lines. Um, but essentially, yes, I mean, it, it, it's it's complicated to even use our ideas about sexuality to talk about these relationships, because in the ancient world, it does seem like things were a little bit more fluid. Um, on, that, on the other hand, there is a, a long and famous passage in Plato's Symposium, which is a, a dialogue all about love, in which the, the poet Aristophanes posits that there are people who sort of from birth are inclined to seek out one gender or another. People, women who love women, women who love men, men who love men, and men who love women. Um, all of this is, is by way of saying that we are looking at a culture in which homosexual contact and practice is a regular occurrence, in which it is an important feature of social life and, you know, like all kind of matters of sex, a sort of vexed question. And this is the culture that's then looking back on the Iliad and interpreting for us and giving commentary sort of thereafter. You have a lot of heated debate, especially over the question, uh, to put it perfectly bluntly, of, of which one of them was on top, Achilles or Patroclus. <laughs> uh, this is, in Greek, you, you say the Erastes, the active lover, and the Eromanos, the beloved, the, the passive lover. Um, and it's, it's 
I would say probably more culturally important for the Greeks to determine which of those two things a man is uh, than it is to make distinctions about heterosexual or homosexual practice. Hmm. Um, basically, penetration is manly and uh, acceptable, and being penetrated is uh, sort of womanly and icky. Uh, I'm vastly oversimplifying here because, of course, every relationship has to have both people. So um, there are contexts in which a, a Athenian male might submit to being the Aromanos. You had um, this in samurai culture too, right? I believe so. I don't know much about that. Is, is that the case? Yeah, I took a Cultures of Pre-Modern Japan course and the professor was pretty adamant about it. Yeah, well, I mean, another feature of all this is military culture, right? And the, the idea that um, Spartan love, that, that you uh, fight harder for a lover than you do for a friend. Um, I mentioned earlier Alistair McIntyre, McIntyre, rather, um, who mentions the fact that philia, uh, which often gets translated as friendship, but is really sort of love, not necessarily romantic love based on a mutual goal or mutual interests. Um, philia is common and central to both friendships, male-male friendships, and also marriages. Um, so there's philia between Odysseus and, and his wife Penelope. Uh, and so there's a real sense of kind of fluidity about the way that, that people think about these relationships, with the important caveat, of course, that, that um, male-female relationships produce children and therefore are uh, culturally important in a whole number of other ways. Um, the Greeks kind of argue around this. In some cases, Plato's symposium includes an idea that that pederastic relationships involve spiritual pregnancy, the production of ideas between man and man. Um, but you still have the irreducible fact that, you know, in order to create more of your society, the the way that you do that is with this core relationship between man and woman. Um, but Achilles and Patroclus is a kind of interesting way into talking about a whole series of complicated questions about what was sexuality back then? What is it now? Um, and does the the Greek way of thinking about it in any way complicate our, our own way of thinking about it? Sir Kenneth Dover is kind of a central scholar on this subject. He wrote a long book on Greek homosexuality. Um, but there's been a lot of, especially since it's such a trendy issue, there's been a lot of chit chat about it recently as well. Well, I want to thank you so much, Spencer, for being on this uh, show. And I wanted to ask, lastly, if if there's any work that you're currently doing, if if um, if you want to tell the audience where they can find you or or your work. Sure. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say thank you so much for having me on. This is no been problem. A total Sorry for the technical difficulties. Not a problem at all. It actually makes me feel a little more relaxed because it happens to me all the time. So, um, but. Uh, if, if folks want to read more of the stuff I write, the best place to go is www.rejoice-evermore.com. Uh, that's Rejoice Evermore, a quote from Paul, uh, com with a hyphen in the middle. And that's where I post basically all the stuff I write. So, you know, I, I do essays and articles from time to time. And uh, I, there is also a kind of fun little page about biblical translations that I write and whatever, whatever you're interested in, it's on there. I read an article somewhere by you that was about the uh, influence on the founding fathers that the the ancients had, and that was right. re really interesting. Oh wow, that's great! That, I don't that's know where I saw it. Yeah, it was in the LA Times, I think. That that op-ed. Um, it's about yeah the tradition of sort of Ciceronian thought about the Republic and how that gets recycled by John Adams, my personal favorite founding father. If folks haven't read the David McCullough biography of John Adams, it is a cracking good time. I would I would highly recommend that as well. Awesome. Well, you're you're overflowing with knowledge, and and again, thank you so much. Uh, you know, come back sometime. It was just a treat having you on, and uh, keep up the good work. I would love to come back, and, and the same goes for you. Thank you so much for, for having me on, and uh, awesome podcast. Now, moving on, I want to make a brief mention of Homer's influence on the great Romantic poet John Keats. And this will touch again on the important issue of translation and interpretation. When Keats, an early 19th century poet, first read Chapman's translation of the, quote, deep-browed Homer, he was so overwhelmed that he compared his experience to finding, quote, a new planet. Keats, who was only 21 at the time, was living in London, and he was visiting a friend, the Shakespeare scholar Charles Cowden Clark. 
Clark had obtained a rare translation of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey by the 17th century poet and playwright George Chapman. Now, Keats had definitely read Alexander Pope's translation of the Iliad, which, though a great work of literature, utilized flowery language that was fashionable during the Enlightenment. So here's an example of Pope's translation of Homer. This passage is from the Odyssey, and it describes the shipwreck of Odysseus. And again, it captures all of the polite refinements of the Enlightenment period. Pope translates, quote, His knees no more performed their office, or his weight upheld, his swollen heart heaved, his bloated body swelled, from mouth and nose the briny torrent ran, and lost in lassitude lay all the man. Compare this to Chapman, the translator whom Keats fell in love with. Chapman captures what Clark called the fine, rough old wine of the original. Here is Chapman, quote, Then forth he came, his both knees faltering both, his strong hands hanging down, and all with froth, his cheeks and nostrils flowing, voice and breath spent all to use, and down he sunk to death. The sea had soaked his heart through. Now, with this one, you can see that the Chapman version of Homer is possessed paradoxically of a kind of ancient freshness, of what the poet Algernon Swinburg calls a romantic and sometimes barbaric grandeur. Clark and Keats that night read Chapman's Homer all night long, and when Keats left at six in the morning, with Chapman, quote, looming in his mind, he returned to his lodgings and immediately penned what would become his first great poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer. And I'll read it for you. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards and fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told, that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. So this is, of course, one of Keats's highly celebrated poems, and it's one that Adam Nicholson writes about in his 2015 book, Why Homer Matters. Uh, Nicholson's book is, is an excellent examination of all of the reasons why Homer uh, is still relevant today and always will be. Nicholson argues that on first looking into Chapman's Homer, which I'll say the title itself makes it sound like one is looking through a telescope or even a looking glass, and I think that's Keats's point. Nicholson argues that Keats's poem isn't about Chapman's brilliance. It isn't really about one's first experience reading Homer, even. And it's not about poetic inspiration, per se. The poem, Nicholson argues, is about what happens when Homer touches your soul and provides revelation. The poem is about the very human feelings of awe and wonder that Homer produces. It's about getting lost in Homer's vastness, in his wild strangeness, in his otherness, and in his deep cosmic universality. Through Homer, Keats becomes several figures. He becomes the astronomer. He becomes Homer. He becomes Cortez and all his men. He becomes Chapman. And he even becomes himself. According to Nicholson, by reading Chapman's Homer, Keats, quote, discovered scale. And scale is then what entered his poetry as a kind of private and tender sublime. The often agonized heroics of the heart, in which, just as Homer, love and death engage in an inseparable dance. So it's time now to bring on our Western canon correspondent, the philosopher and classicist Gina Santiago. Gina comes on the show each month to give her take on some of the big ideas and philosophical problems in the literature. She's currently working on her PhD in philosophy, where she specializes in ancient Greek thought. Let's get her on. Hi, Gina. Hi. Good evening, Jordan. How are you? Excellent. How's it going? It's good to talk to you again. 
Good to talk to you again. I am I'm doing well. I don't have anything to complain about. Uh, well, <laughs> What's new with couple, you? <laughs> um, not much. Uh, I'm still chipping away at my dissertation. I do not have any teaching responsibilities, Ooh. but I've decided to, which is fine. Um, I, I actually prefer it that way because I can actually do my main job, which is to finish my dissertation as can, an APD. As you can stay in your PJs. Well, I cannot get that comfortable, but, you know, it's, it's nice just to be able to sit down for, you know, every day and try to chip away, do some more dissertation writing. Um, but I have take on, taken on a couple of projects in it. Well, this podcast and also I will be writing a couple pieces for the Students for Liberty blog this academic year for the 2017, sorry, 2017, 2018 academic year. Yeah. Those guys are great. That's that's exciting. Right. And uh, the first, I, I just submitted my first draft. Uh, it's going to be, it's entitled, uh, Why Libertarians Should Read the Great Books. Oh, fantastic. An introduction. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's great. So, yeah. So that's, I'm basically going to do a pen and mini series on why libertarians should read the great books, focusing on select works. Uh, some of which that you and I are go actually going to discuss over the course of our um, the next couple of months. So I'm looking forward to writing those pieces. Oh, that's superb. And, and you know what? When yeah. you do, we'll I'll read it and, and we'll talk about it on the show. It'll be great. Yes. Um, I, I look forward to your comments on what I have to write. <laughs> Good stuff. So given that you're a philosopher, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about some of the philosophical aspects of the Iliad or, you know, heroic epic in general, if it's not just the Iliad. Um, and specifically right. free will and the self. I, I mean, it's one of the philosophical issues that immediately jumps out at you when you when you read um, the Iliad, for example. So let's let's talk about these Homeric uh, characters. I I've heard the argument myself that these uh, larger than life heroes in in these epics are in some ways they they don't seem to be in control of their destinies. They're like they're they're as if pawns uh, being con their their fates seem to be controlled in a way. I've heard this argument um, in, in the Iliad. Obviously, uh, you've probably read it many times. In the Iliad, the gods are constantly intervening in humans' affairs. The the characters have to go to the gods for help, and Zeus is like the the CEO of the Aegean Sea, and he decides who wins and who loses along with the other gods and. And so my question for you, Gina, is, you know, why should I care about the fate of these characters who don't seem to have free will, or at least that's what some would allege? Isn't the prerequisite of morality the idea that we make free choices, that, that we're in control of our actions? If we're not free to make choices, then how can we even have morality? Uh, that's a very, very good multifaceted question. Um, so I'm going to give you a pretty long-winded response to your uh, question. So the first thing I want to say is that, um, first, I do not necessarily read the Homeric epics as works of philosophy by any means. I, they're not written to be works of philosophy. Mm -hmm. They're pieces of literature. They're mm -hmm. poems. So, um, so despite the fact that our discussion is going to focus on like certain philosophical themes of the Iliad, I I think we should have a disclaimer, you know, to to state that you know this isn't written as a work of philosophy. It's it's a work of literature. It's a work of art. Um, so with that said, um, I, I try to be careful not to superimpose like any like contemporary philosophical concepts over my reading mm. of the Iliad or even the Odyssey. Uh, so I'd just like to start with that. Uh, to the other questions... Why should we care about these characters, or at least empathize with these characters? Uh, well, I guess I want to ask you this. So, so what do you mean by caring about these characters or these figures? Right, that's a good like, question. Are we supposed are we supposed to like find them relatable or mm. empathize with them? Or you know, what I think like, it what is. What do you mean by that question exactly? Right, right. I think it. it my question is that if. If we are all just determined by fate, if we live in a deterministic universe in which we can't make choices from our own agency, if we're not, if we don't have the free will to make our own choices, any choice, any anything that happens to us wasn't a 
something that we did of our own accord. You can't hold someone responsible for doing the right thing, for doing the wrong thing, for being heroic, for being courageous, if they didn't have the free will to make that choice. And a lot of people say that, look, one of the things that that makes the Iliad seem so far away from us is that these characters are so small that they don't they don't seem to be making free autonomous choices that they're not selves in the deeper sense of the word that we can identify with they are sort of just puppets that the gods toy with okay right um so i i I mean i think that even this day sometimes when we're talking about our circumstances or situations or especially in times of distress like sometimes we use fatalistic language right like we Mm -hmm. sometimes talk about ourselves as if we're just passive objects or like the the balls and the pinball machine, you know, being bounced <laughs> around without having any choice or agency. Um, so I think we could still identify with, the, like, even if we were to read the Iliad and the Odyssey and say, well, these characters are basically have no agency or uh, do not seem to exercise any kind of agency of their own. I think that still makes them relatable because sometimes in real life, you know, day to day life, some more than others, we may sometimes feel like we have no control over our circumstances. Now, we might not be necessarily pinning them on a higher authority or these majestic external forces like gods, but, you know, sometimes we feel like we don't have any agency at all in our own lives. And I would imagine that some people feel that more than others. True. Um, And as to your point about the more important philosophical overarching issue, yeah, that's basically a perennial issue in moral philosophy especially within the last hundred years i would say you know and especially you know in light of the scientific research and neuroscience uh that we learn about you know how our brains work or Mm. how our motivations work you know it seems like even now we're chipping away at the very concept of free will or consciousness because it seems like we're just purely determined by these invisible forces and that certainly would pro- pose problems or issues for moral philosophy because, as you were pointing out, if we end up with the conclusion that we have no profound or robust agency, then how can we hold ourselves or anyone else accountable for their actions? Um, so, and, and I think, you know, just being able to talk about sort of that perennial question in moral philosophy and tie it back into the Iliad, I think that shows why, you know, we should read works of literature like the Homeric epics because they do address or hint at or highlight some of these very issues that we're still thinking about or talking about to this very day. So I, that's my initial response to your question. So you're a compa- are you you're not a determinist, are you? You're a com- you're a compatibilist, aren't you? Most sensible I... people I know are compatibilists. <laughs> I, I do, from a, from a pragmatic point of view, on a day-to-day basis, I would characterize myself as a compatibilist. You can't be a libertarian um, if you're not at least a compatibilist. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, I had a cousin of mine ask me that question, just straight up. Like, are you, where do you fall in the free will, the determinist versus, you know, libertarian debate, libertarian in the metaphysical sense of libertarian, not the political sense? And I, I did say to him, I think I I would more or less characterize myself or describe my position as a compatibilist one. I think just on a day-to-day basis, I basically carry myself or comport myself as a compatibilist. Uh, I do feel like I have this sense of agency, if not sometimes an inflated sense of agency in my life. So, uh, Gina, I think that we live the best lives that we can possibly mm-hmm. live when we worry more about the free will side of things uh, as compatibilists when we consider the free will aspect of things what can i do what can i control um instead of what forces are seeking to oppress me what forces are seeking to hold me back what 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 uh deterministic uh mechanistic forces are are uh guiding my life and i don't even really know it that almost seems unproductive i've always felt like the thing that i should be worrying about is what choices do i have what options do i have i am a as Heidegger would put it, a being in situation. I am I am mm-hmm. thrown into this world. I have to choose 
what do you think about that? No, I agree with you. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not entirely fond of Heidegger, but that's <laughs> me neither. Me reference. neither. But I like that idea. I like that word. He came up with some cool it's words. Philosophy, not his, not his, not, not you know his biography or anything. No, like yeah, that. screw that no, guy. I, I just like you. I like some yeah. of his words. <laughs> no, no, he's he was definitely on to something. Um, but yeah, I I, I agree with you. Um, I think it's more useful to assume that we have free will, even just me uttering that point is probably controversial and up for debate. Maybe that can be a discussion for another time. But I think, I mean, we're in trouble if we decide to completely throw out the concept of free will altogether or completely um, sort of like go of any notion that human beings have agency. Like that would just cause a lot of problems. (laughs) I agree with you. Um, For us. Like we would basically have to completely rework even our most basic ethical commitments from a theoretical standpoint, especially. Um, and obviously if we get into the territory of action and practicality, of course there will be problems if we throw out the question of free will or, or at least completely discard the notion that we have free will as human beings. I agree. And I would, I, I don't think I'm overstating it to say that the worst people I know, or, the, or let's put it this way, the human beings I least respect are the human beings who feel that the world is the most determined, who feel that individuals, not just them, but individuals in general have no control over their own lives and, and shouldn't be responsible for their choices. Right. But what do you think is the source of their belief? Is it that, so like, who, who are these people? Like, so are we talking about people who are, you know, severely disadvantaged, were born in the ro- in the most adverse circumstances you can imagine? Or are we talking about people who, just more broadly speaking, just believe that everything is determined? Well, uh, well, it's a it's it's complicated, right? Because Sartre, right, right. Would, Sartre would say things like, you know, even if you're chained to a wall in a prison, you still can choose. You can choose how you're going to think about the situation. You can choose how you're going to orient your mind. You can choose to resist. You can choose to kill yourself. In a war, his his the idea he was talking about World War Two, and he would say things like, you know, this is your war in the sense that you have to make a choice no matter what. You can fight, you can run away, you can protest. And I, I think that even the most oppressed of people have a choice fundamentally. And you're right, there are certain people who have, have less of a choice. There are certain people who are born into horrifying situations and, uh, and, ha- and don't have a lot of uh, you know, representation, who, don't, who are marginalized, who, who are outcast, who are who deserve our um, compassion and, and sympathy. So, so yeah, so there's that on the one hand, but I, I believe, the core of me believes that those people have a choice. Right. I, I mean, just quickly, another uh, figure comes to mind. Have you ever read Victor Frankl's Man Search, Search for, Meaning? for Meaning? Yes. Yes. So I think that's, uh, that's a great example. Basically one of the, yeah, because I mean, he's, <laughs> he survived the Holocaust and he basically um, based his entire psychological approach uh, mm-hmm. on that point. You know, yep. at the end of the day, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in, you still have a choice to make. And at the very basic level, uh, you can base your life on some meaning or some value, yes. right? Yes. Uh, that's sort of, like, you can still find meaning in any given situation. And that's basically like the I guess we could say the core tenet of the of his book, Man's Search for Meaning, and his local therapy That's practice. That's right. That's right. And, right, and he, it was born from like the most, perhaps like one of the most dire, degrading circumstances you can conceive of. You know, the Holocaust, like like surviving a concentration camp. So it's you're right. Um, you're right. Yeah. And, to, and to answer your question, no, it's not people who give up in circumstances like that or who lose hope in circumstances right. like that that I'm targeting. I am saying though, that, that people like that do have a choice. But on the other hand, the, yeah. the people I'm talking about are typically end up being like the privileged leftist types who <laughs> think that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, who feel yes, like... I know, uh, I know exactly where we're going. Yeah. That we're all right. just sort of these passive agents whom things happen to. Uh, speaking of that, let's maybe I'll guide us back to the Iliad. That was my fault getting yes. off, <laughs> off track, but it's great. No, uh, it's good. I think uh, we're demonstrating, or at least uh, pointing out the relevance of our discussion <laughs> of the Homeric epics. Or all right, you Iliad. saved me. Okay. Yeah. So, so what about scenes like 
the battle between Menelaus and and Paris. It's like it's like the fate of the Trojan War depends on this battle. Helen's up there with Priam watching. And what happens? Aphrodite lifts him off to the safety of his rooms, or or the scene with um, Ios and and Hector, or the death of Patroclus. It's like every time you feel like you're about to see human beings making choices in action, the gods swoop in and lift them off their feet, or 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 in the case of um, Patroclus, you know, make it an unfair fight. Doesn't this stuff lessen our appraisal of these heroes? Are we, t- are these characters, are these characters selves in the truest sense of the word? I I would say, at least from my perspective, that does not diminish them in my own reading. Um, so one one thing I would like to argue, and I and I pretty much make this argument in the paper that I sent you. Uh, at the very least, we can attribute to them a, a very narrow conception of agency. And that ultimately comes down to how we want to define agency. Mm. Um, so I guess if you were to ask, I mean, if you were to, you know, do like a bunch of inter- interview, a bunch of random people like on the street and you ask them like, I don't know, to define free will or to define a- what agency is. So how do you think like a normal everyday person would answer that question? Like how would they define free will or like how would they define their source of agency? How do you think they would define it? Oh, um, the the average man on the street, um, you know, Jay, Jay Leno goes out on the street and asks a person <laughs> what is free will. I think most people would say the ability to make choices the, uh, in, in one's own life. Maybe. I don't know. Right. So, and if you wanted to be Socratic about it, and you wanted to press them on that definition, like, well, what do you mean by making choices? Is it me just sitting down and deliberating on what course of action I can take? Or does it mean I uh, decide on a course of action and I'm effective in carrying out or undertaking that course of action? Interesting. So, um, I guess one way we can approach the way that free will, we can put that in scare quotes when we're talking about it in the context of Iliad. Um, So I think we would have to come up or talk about a very narrow, relatively narrow, thin conception of agency when it comes to the figures or characters in the Iliad. Um, So basically three salient features of agency in uh, the Iliad. So one, you know, you have you do have these characters often and frequently engaging in some kind of deliberation about the choices they have to make, mm-hmm. and there are several scenes in which this happens. Uh, they do take the time to think about courses of action they have to take or the courses of action that are actually available to them, um, and even surmising the outcomes of those actions. Um, and you do have passages that uh, explicitly show these characters reflecting on and responding to like, certain aspects of their circumstances. Mm. Um, And it seems ultimately, you know, these characters do make some choices as to how they would like to respond in a certain circumstance, even responding to the gods intervening. True. So, So basically, if you were to just take those three points, it boils down to, you know, the Homeric characters just being able to deliberate or having the capacity to deliberate about possible courses of action in particular circumstances gotcha that, that, that makes it yeah. does make sense yeah. so the gods aren't removing the character's agency they're just you know a powerful force affecting the characters in the same way maybe that powerful forces impact our lives like maybe right. they so just it's not, yeah they, maybe so they have just like have less have, agency than we do maybe right so it's more like you don't have zeus or hera like taking over the body of Achilles and making him act a certain way, right. necessarily. It's more like the gods either impede or abet certain courses of action to happen. Gotcha. And I don't think that necessarily robs the characters of any sense of agency, but mm. it does get in the way of whatever the characters <laughs> want to do very often, or enables them to accomplish their goals. Uh, so it's more of like an external... It's more like there are ex- obvious external uh, constraints placed on these characters and not so much that they are incapable of exercising agency. Uh, right. They're not necessarily like puppets, you know. They're right. actual human beings who have thoughts, who react in certain ways, and can deliberate. And I think deliberation right. is a, the important part here, or at least the important piece here. Right, that that makes sense, you know. And, and there are, are a lot of people in in our world who face 
similarly disruptive forces that inhibit their ability to make fully uh, free, deliberative choices. And so maybe we could think of them like that or something, these characters. Right, and we can... Right, we can make choices, but it does not guarantee that we will be effective in a changing the state of affairs altogether. Or we might be able to affect the state of affairs in some degree, but not to the extent that we would like. Um, so what we see in the Iliad is that, you know, the characters are not, like, the, by themselves are not affecting or changing the states of affairs. The gods are actually heavily intervening and altering the state of affairs. Mm. So... Thinking about what a self is, you know, we we like to um, d- delineate ourselves, human beings, from animals, and say that what makes us human is that we have this deep self. We're reflective. We're metacognitive. We're you know self-aware individuals who evaluate our actions and our choices and and regret things and and we're aware of our own mortality. Um, are figures like Achilles, Hector? Odysseus, Penelope, are these characters, are they, are they fully human? Are they human all too human as we are? <laughs> um, so I guess it depends on like whether or not you think that the Achilles or Helen or um, Hector are one-dimensional characters. I guess it depends on how fleshed out you think the characters actually are. Like I can imagine some people reading, you know, the Iliad and Odyssey thinking, well, this, these are epic poems, and these are not realistic human beings. They're very one-dimensional for one reason or another. Uh, or someone might read them sort of walking away with a different perspective on, like, I don't know, on how multifaceted these characters are. So I think they're very human. Um, one of the great things about the Homeric epics is that you get into sort of the mindset and the raw emotions of these characters in certain scenes. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things I was getting at when I was talking about uh, thinking about agency in the Homeric epics as fundamentally um, about deliberation is like they do display some self awareness. Um, at least that's what I take away from reading the Iliad I agree anyway, with you. Odyssey. I agree. So I think they're very human, um, they're flawed they're very driven and they fail and they react to the, and they respond to failures and successes in so many of the same ways that we would to this day. So yeah, I would say they do seem very human to me. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about classical Greek literature. You know, you get a very interesting, rich uh, presentation of the human condition and the human experience. Um, like, even the heroes are flawed in some fundamental way. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not these one-dimensional paragons of virtue. It's the complete opposite. Right. Um, and even though we're supposed to think of Achilles as the paradigmatic Homeric hero, you know, he's not sort of the paragon in a, in a strictly positive sense. No, <laughs> um, he's not. Not at all. If any, no, if anything. I mean, I think one thing we should talk about is that, you know, these characters are um, sort of part of a culture society that is centered on the heroic code. You know, mm-hmm. it's a warrior culture, heroic code, warrior culture, and they derive their sense of self worth in terms of like how, where they stand with respect to the heroic code. And it's very clear that Achilles is driven by the heroic, heroic code, and that's his. Razan Dutra, basically, you yes. know, to be the epitome or the perfect embodiment of the heroic code in this particular culture. Right. And and reading the paper that you sent me, I I was struck by the fact that people see this adherence to the heroic code itself as a way in which someone like Achilles doesn't have that kind of deep self. And I read that and I said to myself, but isn't a human being's identity culturally and communally mediated in many ways? Isn't our identity bound up in many ways with how others receive us and interact with us? And to me, what part of what makes you a person of agency and authenticity in the right. sort of you know existential existence precedes essence sense is the fact that you are what you do in the world, in society, with others, embedded in a culture. And Achilles is is human because he adheres to the heroic code. And yet, he spends the majority of the story of the Iliad sulking and, <laughs> and rebelling and 
and not being the hero that that everyone wants him to be and th- the fact that he grapples with what is expected of him and makes many choices uh is is what makes him a whole person to me yeah right uh and one of the other things we have to be careful about i mean because the very concept of agency is uh could be troubling or contentious because it you know from the outset of our discussion we've had to define our terms and one of them being agency so uh, not only would in different individuals probably define agency differently or even the self differently i mean i would imagine it would be safe to assume that people from different cultural contexts would define agency and self differently so uh, one of the things we have to be careful about is not to anachronistically apply some like 21st century notion of self or authentic self and read that particular notion of self into the Iliad Odyssey because it's just there's a complete mismatch there. You know, it would be incongruous to read to uh, understand the self that way. That's a very good point because um, I often yeah. go off on people who read their cultural norms, who read their you know. Uh, progressive values into ancient literature and so i think that's a very apt reminder (laughs) right and it's not it's not even a normative thing it's a purely descriptive thing Mm -hmm. like the fact is like different people will define or understand self and agency differently like that's just descriptive thing not Mm -hmm. you know we're not prescribing anything um so one very interesting book that uh that i came across um and I think you would actually enjoy reading this book. I don't know how accessible it is because it's an academic publication and it could be prohibitively expensive and I don't even think a lo- your local library would carry it. It's uh, Christopher Gill's uh, Personality in Greek Epic Tragedy and Philosophy, uh, The Self in Dialogue. And the framework that he gives us, uh, he uh, presents two contrasting or juxtaposed frameworks of understanding the self. So one framework is the subjective, what he calls the subjective individualist model of the self, and he traces that back to Descartes. And obviously Descartes is like centuries and centuries apart from <laughs> Homer or the specific time period in which these characters right. live. And the other model is what he calls the objective participant model, which just based on the way that he presents it, you know, precedes or predates the more subjective individualist approach that we can trace back to Descartes. Right. Um, so the subjective individualist model of the self is, I would think the self that most of us in the 21st century would identify with the most is basically right. the idea of like the self, like the I, me as an unencumbered standalone individual. Like Sounds like uh, his, naive like this realism. unencumbered individual. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good way to put it. And the objective participant model, it does not have that, does not present that unencumbered individual self, but rather it highlights the self or the individual human being as being very much embedded in a specific context and their identity being partly informed by their culture, their locale, their heritage, or their circumstances, or the va- specifically the values that come from their specific culture. So... Right. If so we were to place, yeah, if we were to place the Homeric self in either one category, the more appropriate one would be the objective participant model, and not the sort of twenty more modern subjective mm-hmm. individualist model of the self. Gotcha. That would just be anachronistic for one thing. You get the sense that these characters are not, you know, it's not this dualistic Cartesian. Uh, I think, therefore, I am, and it's not this division of the mind and then matter on the other hand. It is a wholly integrated self, it seems. Right, exactly. And the subjective individualist model just presents the individual regardless and or completely detached from like the cultural social context. Right. Um, take Achilles, for example. Like He's very much beholden to or abiding by the, hero- the heroic code, right? That his entire culture is centered on it. Right. And he defines himself in terms of it. So you can't say that, you know, the subjective individualist model would be the appropriate lens through which you can try to make sense of the actions and motivations of these characters. It's just anachronistic and just doesn't match up at all. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, he's not Achilles without that heroic code. 
And yet, and yet, Gina, look at Achilles. This throughout the whole uh, poem, he's supposed to be fighting, and yet he sulks. He's angry, <laughs> and while the the code would urge him to fight, he can't bring himself to fight. And and w- what is it? What is is he becoming a self? His pride, his his sense of the injustice of having you know Briseis stolen from him, mm-hmm. and, and he's the, he's the greatest warrior. He's the one who deserves the most respect. They should be kissing his feet, and instead they're stealing his women. And and he has this <laughs> desire for revenge. And I, I, his most human moment to me wasn't in his discussion with Thetis, uh, trying to deliberate about his fate. But for me, it was in that final battle, he holds back from fighting, basically until the Trojans breach the ramparts and set fire to one of the ships, and he still won't fight. If you ask me, in this scene, he is proving that he has free will, that he can hold back, that he's free to make this choice not to fight. Uh, and, And what causes him to fight, ultimately, it's the death of his pal, his or his boyfriend, his his beloved friend. <laughs> you know, it, right. it's so yeah. romantic and and almost modern. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So again, this kind of goes back to the point that you and I were talking about not too long ago. It's like at the very least, like these characters do exhibit self awareness and they understand their own motivations and what they want and they deliberate on their actions just based on, you know, what they want and what they hope to achieve. Uh, you know, again, whether or not they're effective <laughs> in their courses of action is an entirely different matter because as we were pointing out, the gods like to play favorites and actively intervene at certain key points during the battles. Right, and yet I and I and yet I still romanticize Achilles. I, I think it's a. I think that's actually an appropriate, you know, sort of response to him because I mean his reputation is known. We know what his reputation is supposed to be, and he knows what his reputation is supposed to be. Um, but we don't see him fighting all the time. Instead, like you're saying, he's he's reacting. He's in some cases emotionally to what's happening to him or any kind of perceived affront you know, to what he, to his uh, status or his reputation. Um, So I think it's still appropriate to romanticize him because (laughs) of that very multifacetedness, right? I mean, it's very rare to, it's very rare to encounter these kind of figures, you know, I mean, just think about action movies, right? (laughs) <laughs> you don't really see that many multifaceted characters in action movies. Right. Um, even Gina in, in Beowulf. I had to teach Beowulf yeah. to my seniors. And even the, the students who love action movies, who want to see, you know, die hard, and they want to see the hero win and the hero blow things up. When, the, when we read Beowulf, they, are, they were like, Beowulf's perfect. He's too perfect. He's not, <laughs> I can't identify with him. He doesn't have any problems. He doesn't... Um, he is very one dimensional and i mean achilles just isn't achilles and there's also something separating achilles from the other mortals you know that he associates with the 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 myrmidons and his, and the and the the other greeks he is above them in some ways because his mother is not mortal so he is like seemed to me something like a demigod and so he's not uh, one-dimensional, and, and neither are heroes like Hector. Even Hector, I think for me, the, the great scene with Hector is when he's speaking with Andromache, with, with his uh, wife, yes. and she's pleading yeah. with him, please withdraw from fighting. I, I don't want you to die. My family has been killed already. You're all I have left. And for me, Hector's response after, after basically pledging allegiance to the Heroes Code that you were talking about is something like, look, I have to do this. But I pray that my son will will be like me. In fact, better than me. Uh, preeminent among Trojans, great in strength. I hope he'll be the ruler of Troy, and that someday that they'll say of him, he is better by far than his father. And I hope that you look up to him uh, the way that you look up to me. And I just think that that type of reasoning, that sort of foresight, and that that tragic sense of life, and yet the the choice to adhere to duty, is is profound. That's profound. Right, and I think that's a really mo- not only a very moving scene, and it seems so odd to read that kind of scene in a Homeric epic, right? Such an epic poem. Mm. Um, it, I mean, it just. 
again, like that scene is one of my favorite scenes in the Iliad. Um, but it's actually one of the scenes that very poignantly illustrates sort of the deliberative agency that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, there's a you can see a very deep sense of awareness or in, in uh, Hector coming in that scene. Yeah, um, yeah. And you're in his mind, and yes. reading it. like you're you're very much in his mind. You're reading his thoughts, um, and it's not like you have the gods dictating the you know human beings at that very microcosmic level. You know, right. One's thoughts. Um, they're still free to ponder their choices, um, and I think it would be you know, you would have to make a strong case to say that the. Uh, Homeric characters do not have any sense of self or any agency whatsoever. So I think that scene undermine, would undermine that point quite a great deal. Right, right. This, 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 this is a person who is reasoning as a deep, cogitating self. He's thinking of the past. He's thinking of the future. He's, he's envisioning his posterity. He's empathizing with his wife. And he's weighing costs and benefits and ultimately sacrificing himself for the good of his community. His, his, his choice is either selfless or it's utilitarian or, or both, right. but he, he's also capable of a deep love. Right. Um, so, I mean, just given like everything we've been saying so far, I mean, I definitely do care about these characters. I do empathize with them, and I do find them relatable in different ways mm. because of their multifacetedness. So that's fantastic, Gina, and and I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, you're always fascinating to talk to, and and it's it's nice to talk to a philosopher who's actually thinking deeply, uh, philosophizing about the canon, um, and that's and that's I think that's pretty rare and, and valuable. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a very edifying conversation and I, um, I, I it makes me want to reread the Iliad again <laughs> for the umpteenth time and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation on the Odyssey um, and hope people get I hope our audience members get something from it fantastic I can't wait to hear your thoughts on the Odyssey um, and and I'll I'll talk to you next month thanks again talk to you next month bye 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 Okay, so the last thing I want to do is uh, to move into our Scholar's Den segment. We're going to have to go very quickly this time because we have such a long show this month. Uh, So I want to briefly advertise a fun and interesting read by the great Harvard professor Harvey Mansfield. The book is called Manliness, and like its author, it is a controversial piece of work. Manliness is a comprehensive study of the concept of manliness. Uh, as well as its expression in art, literature, and life. Manliness, the book description insists, quote, is a quality both bad and good, mostly male, often intolerant, irrational, and ambitious. Our gender-neutral society doesn't like it, but it cannot get rid of it. Drawing from science, literature, and philosophy, Mansfield examines the layers of manliness, from vulgar aggression to assertive manliness to manliness as virtue, and to philosophical manliness. Mansfield shows that manliness seeks and welcomes drama, prefers times of war, conflict, and risk, and brings change or restores order at crucial moments, unquote. So that's from the back of the book. So what Mansfield's book basically does is it draws on the Western canon. Um, the book looks closely at figures like Homer and Plato and uh, Nietzsche and even Ernest Hemingway and, and others. Uh, We don't have time to discuss the book in depth, but in the spirit of Homer's Iliad, I'll read a few passages of Mansfield's book, uh, specifically discussing manliness in the Iliad, uh, with special attention given to the character of Achilles. There is a quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon. Achilles, knowing himself to be the better man, disdains Agamemnon's claim to his respect and obedience, and the two exchange furious insults. So Mansfield is setting up the scene here. The quarrel is not so much over the woman as between the two parties, Agamemnon claiming the authority of his lineage and Achilles the power of his virtue. 
The eternal dispute between ancestral and natural right opens up among the he-men, because lineage, even to the gods, does not guarantee virtue, or, as we would say, birth is one thing and merit another. Agamemnon relies on his scepter, symbol of his authority and made by the god Hephaestus, but Achilles swears by a scepter of his own and relies on his spear. Manliness appears first not as a claim of authority, but as the assertion of virtue against authority, an assertion always required because authority is always in the way of virtue, and virtue never gets a free welcome from authority. In the course of asserting itself against authority, virtue becomes a possible claim on the basis of which one can assert one's worthiness to rule, thus a claim to authority. Even then, it is only one of several claims and must expect to face resistance from other claims. We are aware that true virtue is rarely the winner of a competitive examination, and if it is, it cannot take success for granted and still needs to assert itself. Meritocracy does not eliminate the necessity of advertising one's merits, and we should not look down upon Achilles' boastful vaunts. To vindicate his wrath, to make good on his claim, Achilles faces great risk as it has been foretold to him by his mother Thetis that if he returns to war to avenge the death of his friend Patroclus, he will die soon afterward. He has a choice between returning home to live in peace or staying at Troy and going to battle to be killed with great glory. Eventually, he chooses glory, dies, and goes to Hades. When Odysseus later sees his shade there and asks him how things are going, Achilles replies, Better slave on earth than king of hell. He was dissatisfied with the choice he had made. Manliness rejects the safety of self-preservation in favor of the glory of risking one's life to vindicate one's rights and deserts. Homer shows us Achilles ruining his decision, and he wrote in the Odyssey of Odysseus's finding his way home through many risks, having made the choice that Achilles declined. Homer does not endorse either the wrath or the repentance of Achilles, it seems. He sings of his wrath and its consequences, to remind human beings of the need for heroes, and to remind heroes of the need for humanity. Achilles' assertiveness causes him to sulk in his tent, which is the aloofness of the manly man, and to vindicate his right by avenging the death of his friend, a return to battle, and a kind of entry into politics. For Odysseus, the return home permits him to resume his family life and his rule in Ithaca, after asserting his right to both against the suitors of his faithful wife. What most obviously distinguishes Homer from Hemingway is the presence of the gods as actors in the story. The gods are a reminder of the need for authority in human affairs, of a higher power to which human beings can point when claiming their rights. Gods are necessary to manly assertion, because without them, assertion is mere assertion, arbitrary and unsupported. But the gods also get in the way of manliness, as Hemingway indicates, by forcing men, even he-men, to call on and thus depend on them. Okay, so go out and buy Manliness by Harvey Mansfield. It's a book that is both wise and incisive, as well as fun and provocative. You won't regret it. It's a very interesting read. Now, folks, the moment you've been waiting for... Our final guest on this month's show is Emory Professor Mark Bauerlein. Dr. Bauerlein is senior editor at First Things Magazine. He's worked for the National Endowment of Arts, and he writes regularly for outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Washington Post, the Claremont Review of Books, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. In this interview, Dr. Bauerlein and I discuss his book, The Dumbest Generation, The subtitle is How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. We also discuss the current state of the humanities, uh, literary criticism, moral relativism, Christianity. We cover a lot of topics. Since it's a long interview, I'm going to skip the fluff and drop us right into the discussion as I ask Dr. Bauerlein about an increasing aesthetic and moral relativism among today's students. Enjoy the conversation.
Do you think it's because their generation in general has rejected the idea that one can even have taste, that uh, aesthetic judgments are subjective and relative? Jordan, it is one of the most deep-seated prejudices now in college students today. The fact that when it comes to matters of culture and taste, we don't judge. We, we, we function as relativists, and we let people do what they want to do and enjoy what they want to enjoy. I give them the refutation of that attitude. I push it very hard in my classes. And there are two points that I make to them. One is that the failure to discriminate between works of greatness and works of not so greatness is a failure to function as a fully formed grown-up and in not making those distinctions you're cutting yourself off from an experience of something so much better than the youth culture that you are all immersed in. That's one thing. The other thing is these judgments are made constantly. And the the idea that you live in this, you know, do your own thing, don't judge others, be tolerant, be open, that doesn't happen. And I had a perfect illustration of this uh, last semester in a freshman class when I was bringing this up, and the students immediately recoil from this idea. And one student was saying, I mean, it is just subjective. People like what they like, and you like what you like just because you've been conditioned in certain ways, and we don't have any basis for making these distinctions between what, what I, the example I gave of Shakespeare and rap music, rap lyrics. And... Uh, she rejected that. And then one minute later, we were talking about things, and I asked the students to pick things that they really thought were great in the last year. And one student sitting next to her says, oh, well, I, I think this movie. And the student who was pushing the relativist said, oh, that movie was stupid. There you go. That's a value judgment. <laughs> so the problem with their moral and epistemological relativism is that they don't – part of it is that they're – they're hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. I pointed this out in, in my last episode. They're perfectly willing to refer to Rotten Tomatoes and read uh, critics' aesthetic uh, criticism on films that... So, for example, I said, you know, you're not going to go see a film that Rotten Tomatoes gave a 14%, and you're perfectly willing to give an aesthetically based Yelp review uh, online after you go to a restaurant where... You didn't like the the how the food was cooked or how the service was or the atmosphere. You're perfectly willing to render your aesthetic judgments on on those topics. But when it comes to literature, when it comes to one's life philosophy, all of the sudden um, that disappears, and one cannot make uh, objective uh, or I should say. Uh, Aesthetic claims that are based on real criteria in the objects that are being held up for aesthetic judgment. Right. And it's impossible. It's impossible, you guys. Give me a break. Now, I think part of their hesitation to form judgments is when those judgments that they do form can be charted across any political incorrectness. So my example of Shakespeare and rap music sounds like I'm knocking African-American culture and we don't go there. Anything that it can appear racist or sexist or any of the other isms that we're supposed to stay away from, that uh, makes them afraid. And the achievers that I teach, those who go to Emory University, where I am. They they have learned that success comes partly by reducing risk, by not saying the wrong thing, 
by not getting into trouble, by not offending anyone. You keep your head down. You avoid controversial topics. That's what the achiever mentality uh, is about. And they've been told this either directly or indirectly out of their own experience. They know that there's a high degree of conformity in their world on all the sensitive issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, peer pressure has never been so high, partly because the digital age puts everyone under surveillance much more than they ever were before. And a digital mob is always ready to form if people cross those sensitive areas and and give offense. And aesthetic judgments can can be offensive, you know. Issues of taste can reach deeply into people. If you go out on a date and you go to a movie and one 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 hates the movie and the other loves the movie, that's a hard bridge to cross. And sometimes I think it's worse than politics, you know. Contrasting tastes are are harder to uh, to accommodate than uh, in contrasting politics. That's right. And and you know something that my karate teacher told me years ago. He said, "If I come over to you and I fix your stance, it's because I respect you and I think you can do better." Um, there's something in this, for example, it is taboo to criticize Black Lives Matter. Um, that is racist. You, you know, that, that's the problem. If, if it's taboo to, to make an argument about why Black Lives Matter is, is bad, then that whole discussion is shut down. It's over. We you, know, you know, I have seen many instances, Jordan, in academia, in gatherings, discussions when... Uh, people have done precisely that. Uh, I saw, for instance, uh, that, that is shift the issue away from substance and onto identity. Uh, I saw once uh, a man give a critical lecture about a distinguished scholar, and he was solely focusing on the work. Well, someone in the audience said, you, you attacked this person, and given that he is one of the first major figures to come out of the closet in American academia a couple of decades ago. Don't you think this really could be regarded as gay bashing? Oh, my goodness. This had nothing to do with it. And yet the speaker, he apologized. He said, I didn't mean any such thing, and I don't want to give anyone the impression that that's what this is about. He should have said... Uh, that has nothing to do with this. Let's get back to the issues here. Nope, nope. And everyone in the audience learned a lesson from that exchange, which said, be very careful what you say about certain people who possess certain historically disadvantaged identities. And the problem with that is that it's, it's hypocritical. Again, it's dehumanizing, right? It reduces an individual to... Uh, their to their identity group, and I thought we were trying to stay away from that. Right, right. Yeah, it's not the content of your character. It's it's your it's your demographic, and that sums you up. And and I want to say, what an impoverished way of addressing a human being. You have just erased all the individuality, the uniqueness of that person by these group categories that, again, are, are, are depleting human beings of depth, right? This is a very superficial way of looking at, uh, at others. But it's easy. It's easy, and all, all, the, uh, all the moral poles are in place, right? You know exactly where, where you can stand on, on these things. I, I, I don't care about these things anymore. I, I just, uh, I don't, I don't. I'm too old to to bother with worrying about these niceties of of not giving offense. 
So I want to shift here and and maybe talk a little bit about what's going on in your discipline. You wrote a book called Literary Criticism and Autopsy, and you're talking about the cultural turn uh, in literary studies. And you're arguing essentially, uh, I'll read a description that I think maybe you probably provided to the um, UPenn Press. As the study of literature has extended to cultural contexts, critics have developed a language all their own. Yet scholars of literature today are so unskilled in pertinent socio-historical methods that they compensate by adopting cliches and catchphrases that serve as substitutes for information and logic. Thus, by labeling a set of ideas an ideology, they avoid specifying those ideas, or by saying that someone essentializes a concept, they convey the air of decisive refutation. As long as a paper is generously sprinkled with the right words, clarification is deemed superfluous. And I'll just add one more thing. Bauerlein contends that such usages only serve to signal political commitments, prove membership in subgroups, or appeal to editors and tenure committees. Um, So it sounds like you're not so much making Harold Bloom's argument that critical theory or cultural criticism is, is an improper lens through which to view texts. You're not arguing that cultural criticism can't be done. It sounds like you're arguing that cultural criticism is being done poorly, um, and it's being done by people who are using, uh, who are equivocating and using language to obfuscate, so that they can propagate a certain political worldview. Yeah, and and the crucial element here was uh, productivity and competition. Over the course of the really the 19, 1970s and 1980s, uh, when more and more people were pouring into graduate school and the job market was shrinking, it, it became harder and harder to devote long years of homework, of study, of book reading without taking into account the institution. That is without finding ways of branding yourself in certain ways, marketing yourself, uh, moving quickly through graduate school, speaking in a certain way to make yourself attractive to institutions who were hiring people. They wanted to see you characterize yourself. Are you theory or anti-theory? Are you a feminist? Are you a deconstructor? Are you a psychoanalytic? person? Are you a political person? What are your politics? In other words, the institutional uh, the institutional characteristics and traits you could summon for yourself became more important than the books you've read, how much learning you have acquired, how much breadth you have. Are you able to teach a course in Shakespeare and a course in modernist poetry? Have you done your homework on things? No. What mattered is, can you walk into an interview and talk the talk? Can you seem conversant about contemporary trends? Are you up to date on the latest theories? And can you shift from them with flexibility and sophistication? Well, this became a very glib approach to demonstrating your your learning and it's I virtue saw signaling it, you, you, part of it was virtue signaling you had and it's just signaling you don't want to be too explicit about it but uh, in your in your language you would often then adopt cliches right institutionalized language language that had a pragmatic purpose again of branding you in a particular way now if that's what you have to do, you have to impress people, you got to get a job, you have to show you have membership in the club. In the you've, tribe. Got, you've got your union card. Yeah. Now, is reading all of the novels of Henry James going to help you with that? Is going into if if, if you're studying, uh, if if you're studying uh, uh, the the modernist poetry of of William Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens, who were in living in Greenwich Village for a 
time in, in the second decade of the 20th century. Are you going to go through the New York newspapers during those years uh, to get a feel for what daily life was like for them as they were formulating their first modernist experiments? Are you going to do those kinds of archival researches? Well, that takes a lot of time. Isn't it much easier just to master the lingo, right? <laughs> get the catchphrases, get the hot terms clear, and perform them. In other words, become an institutional performer, not a person of great depth and learning. I was fortunate, and I went to a graduate school at UCLA that required intense learning and breadth. They flunked out a lot of people. We had hard qualifying exams. We had to take courses in eight historical fields. Now, you know, we had to do two languages uh, besides English. We had to do philology. Now we've, we've lightened all those requirements. We've tried to shorten the graduate school time and uh, we have as a result made people work more about being practitioners of professional performance rather than people of great knowledge and erudition and a literary historical sensibility people who have what T.S. Eliot called the historical sense Right, a deep feel for the vibrancy of the past, that the past is still dynamic and alive for them. That is what that that, that that's why I called it an autopsy. Okay. We were producing more people who were glib but not learned. And they did well. Jordan, they got the jobs. They did well in the interviews. They gave the slick job talk when they were on campus and they were the ones who succeeded and i i saw many of them and boy did i think man they were thin but they but they had a certain talent if you're a lover of english prose um it just strikes me as being unimaginable that you would that you would put yourself through that i mean where's the sense of loving literature um like bloom writes about um I remember when I was a student, I ultimately decided not to get a PhD in English because I didn't think I'd fit in. Um, even though I had really good grades, the dissertation topics and the professor's specialties were just so odd and ideologically homogeneous that I honestly didn't think I could play that game. I love the literature too much. I just I felt like I'm not willing to spend a half decade learning about theories of oppression or intersectional feminist poetics or Walt Whitman's whiteness. It's like in order to be a, a, a PhD in English literature today, you have to be up on post-colonial studies and uh, transnational studies and 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 gender studies and new media and all of this stuff that seems to be just utterly devoid from what I imagine. It makes someone love literature, right? So I wanted to study 18th century literature, romantic poetry, Victorian literature. And I was told, okay, you can study those things, but only if you study them in the context of race, gender, oppression, colonialism, trauma, all of those things that are really hip. And I just said, I can't, I can't do that. I cannot do that. Literature and literary history became of secondary importance to most people who've gone into the profession in the last 15 or 20 years. What is more important is the identity uh, issues, uh, sexual identity, gender, uh, racial identity, uh, and politics, right? Uh, imperialism and, and uh, neoliberalism, colonialism, post-colonialism, disability studies is, is, is very important now for many people. In other words, these really social topics uh, whether issues of social psychology or 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 sociology or uh, socio political uh, issues, that is where the real motivation lies. Not that many younger people have that passion for uh, for Victorian poetry. That's not where the action is for them. 
it is one reason why the humanities have literary studies, including, uh, have deteriorated so much. And I mean by that in terms of their popularity on campus. Jordan, 20 or 30 years ago, you could not be a flagship university if you did not have a major English department. It's no longer true. Uh, we use the humanities, uh, you know, the foreign languages now only have one per make up one percent of majors in this country. Only one percent of students who earn a bachelor's degree major in a foreign language. Uh, English is now a little over three percent. It used to be close to eight percent. Um, the humanities now are increasingly window dressing on college campuses. All the action is in the is in the hard sciences and the business areas, the pre-professional. Uh, areas. Uh, that's where the success of the university is, and that's where the smart students go uh, these days. And one reason is because how many students, how, how many 19-year-olds would go into an English class, a basic English class, and start hearing about post-colonialism and be inspired to I come agree. back? I agree. So isn't the fault with with you folks, with with the mentors, with the with those of you who are passing down the tradition, with the administrators, like I don't really blame them for not majoring in English because I've I, I, I had to sit through these English classes and for example we took I took a course called uh, literature and psychology and we spent the whole time deconstructing Freud using people like Deleuze and Guattari and the whole thing was well, a what? What level was this course? It was a 200 level course. Um, oh, and like it, sophomore level? Yeah, and it was, a, it was a grad student who was almost done with his PhD, and we spent just the whole time deconstructing uh, Freud in this really resentful, vindictive way. It is utterly irresponsible to assign sophomores uh, Deleuze and Guattari. That's a book the anti-Oedipus book, I presume. That is a book deeply enmeshed in French psychoanalysis of the mid-20th century. It doesn't make much sense if you haven't worked through the French Freud, as, as it was called. That would be like uh, someone bringing in the, the very advanced uh, concepts of topology into a freshman algebra course. I mean, there has to be some seek some some well in in education they call it scaffolding that makes these works make some sense. And cases like this of a graduate student getting in there and doing his dissertation with these students who are eighteen and nineteen years old, well, I, I no wonder. I imagine a lot of kids in the class were just shaking their heads and saying, "What are we doing in here?" Uh, and it's it's it, it is it's not going to bring people into the major. People are going to come into literary studies and come back if they can be inspired, if they have fun, if it's meaningful to them in a personal way. That doesn't mean dumbing down the literature. No, that doesn't mean trying to make personal appeals. What it does mean, though, is to read Macbeth and to make Lady Macbeth really come alive. You know, when Lady Macbeth is sleepwalking at night and, and they're watching her out damned spot. That's you right. know, and out damned she, spot. She, she concludes by saying, well, what's the exact line? Who would have thought the old man, man had so much blood so in much him? Blood in him. Yes. That's a creepy line today. <laughs> That's, right. That's a shocking statement, and she's she's again she's she's sleepwalking there. A, a teacher should be able to have students see that and hear that and say, "This is real stuff, and I want more of this kind of thing. I want more of human life and meaning and death and honor and dishonor and." love and jealousy and passion and betrayal and villainy, all of the things that the humanities can present, and most of all, beauty and sublimity. 
A sublime experience is one that sticks with you for the rest of your life. Can we enact that? For students, they'll come back. But again, the goal of enchantment is not the goal of my colleagues. What they want is for the students to engage in political enlightenment, which is to say, I want, I want them to, to realize what I realize about, about the world. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awful. <laughs> um, these are the things that you're talking about are universal human themes. They have nothing to do with um, uh, I, identity markers that are given to us at birth. They are just universal themes that everyone can identify with. And I feel like that's what we're getting away from, and I'm really sad about that. Yeah, and I, I, I think the humanities will continue as, again, a niche field. I don't think the political side of it is going to be very successful much longer because the political side only kept people excited if they felt like it was having an impact. And as they see fewer students coming into their courses, fewer majors, people coming in and signing up as majors, as they see fewer people reading humanities scholarship, most of these books and essays are published and they disappear and are never heard from ever again. Right. So libraries just buy them basically and, and they're never cited. Most of them are yeah. never cited once. Yeah, and I think that libraries even themselves are going to start saying, can we just get a PDF copy? No one ever checks these books out. We don't need the books. And they're very expensive to keep, to buy and to main, to keep. Uh, they take up space. Uh, we'll see if we come back to the inspiration side of the humanities, the enjoyment that students have. But we will need to get professors who have the formation, which isn't happening. And I don't know if it can happen because of the, the sort of group think that's happening within, um, within, you know, English departments, you know, given the adamant emphasis that universities place on diversity, it seems that they could care less about the most important kind of diversity, that being diversity of thought. I wrote for a blog called Heterodox Academy. I don't know if you've heard of it. And their whole mission is to stress the importance of viewpoint diversity in academia. Uh, one thing, though, I, that I wish they talked about more is how the absence of viewpoint diversity leads to the entire nullification of certain disciplines within English literature, for example, and the neglect of whole avenues of inquiry. Um, John Haidt has talked about things like how there's really no good military history programs anymore. But I'm interested if you have anything to say about, about that. Are there areas in English that have completely fallen by the wayside? You, you certainly find certain, uh, certain areas and issues overlooked. For instance, uh, the American literature through up until and into the 20th century was profoundly influenced by American religion. The, if you read the Psalms... In King James, you will hear these lines echoed everywhere in American literature over and over again. How many American literature teachers in the academy, oh, young ones, we'll say, are steeped in American religion? Most of them are thoroughly secular people, or if they are religious, they confine their religion to Sunday. It doesn't inform their work that much. I mean, I, I only had one teacher ever tell me how important the Bible was. And I, I did work in American literature, 19th century American literature. So I, I feel like I, I, I had a big gap in my education. And part of that is the secularization bias that professors have. And that's bad education that took place uh, right there. That's what I see, what I see in, in the humanities. Uh, that uh, the emphasis on liberal secular outlooks really keeps a lot of historical materials off the syllabus. And writers, you know, I, I remember uh, going through graduate school and all these theoretical works would, would come out. And we were reading uh, Michel Foucault and 
Jacques Derrida and all the prominent figures there, but it left a whole range of, I'm going to call it cultural theory, untouched because it was aligned with forms of conservatism. For instance, uh, the work of Friedrich Hayek, the libertarian economist, mm -hmm. social thinker, uh, he has a couple of very philosophical works that touch upon cultural matters, like the counter-revolution of science. Very important, sophisticated work. Never heard a word about it, even though Foucault was a great fan of Hayek, said this must be read. Uh, I don't know if any humanities course taught Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and The Last Man because that was a neoconservative document. But Hegelian, so... It, it, it starts with Hegel, and it ends with Nietzsche. So it's right in the line of continental thought that Foucault lies in. I had lunch once with uh, Jean-François Lyotard, one of the leading figures. He, and this was in the mid-'90s, he said, this book is the most important book of political theory that has come out of America in the last three decades. So there you have one of your own highlighting this book. Now, the only times I ever heard that book mentioned in all my years in the humanities was in a curt dismissal of it. No one ever said a word about the substance of the book. They just dismissed that book. So there's an example of certain ideas, contents, books, and traditions simply being expelled from consideration. They don't argue against them. They simply ignore them. I read uh, an article that you wrote about the Amy Wax situation, and, and you sort of made the same argument that um, her defense of bourgeois values, um, the people that sort of uh, ganged up on her weren't even, didn't have anything to say about her argument. It was just a sort of, you know, superficial ad hominem attack, the whole thing. Right. They, they just wanted to condemn her. They didn't want to uh, argue with her. And, you know, the really appalling thing about their letter uh, in response to Amy Wax's argument that much of the social dysfunction in America is the result of the abandonment of bourgeois norms of behavior uh, about marriage, about public conduct, about respecting authority, delayed gratification, Protestant work ethic, all, all those old-fashioned things. Mm -hmm. They jumped on her, uh, particularly the phrase when she said all cultures are not equal. And she held bourgeois culture up as a better formula for success than, say, inner-city gangster culture. She's uh, absolutely right about that. But they... They attacked her for that, and then they said to students, if any of you, in this open letter they wrote, if any of you uh, are running up against bias here at Penn, you come talk to us. In other words, they're just inviting students to turn into tattletales. They're telling them, instead of just shrugging off something that irritates you, let's, let's go ahead and run with it. If you're taking a, if someone says something offensive, you act on it instead of just shrugging it off and going about your business. No, this is the invitation to young people to continue thinking of themselves as adolescents. You know, the heterodox academy people, the first things to say is you have to have a thicker skin if you're going to live in a free society. We have free speech. People are going to annoy you. You just have to shrug it off and, and move on. That's the cost of the First Amendment. We have to have a little bit of a thicker skin out in, in public life. So you mentioned the, just earlier, you mentioned the, um, the Catholic or religious element in, in literature and, and how that was being sort of put by the wayside. Um, I went to your Wikipedia page and I was struck by a passage that said, in 2012, Bauerlein announced his conversion to Catholicism 
He has self-described himself as an educational conservative, while he socially and politically identifies as being pretty liberal and libertarian. Um, so I want to ask you, um, shifting here a little bit, what do you mean by educational conservative? Um, I imagine as a teacher in the English department at Emory, your, your educational conservatism probably makes you a rare breed, does it not? It does. I mean, I, I, an education conservative believes that there are great books. Mm-hmm that uh, tradition is a value Mm -hmm. and that uh, no student should be encouraged to adopt a critical or rebellious, challenging position until that student has immersed himself in the tradition that he aims to undermine. In other words, you got to know all the bunk before you debunk. Please do your homework. <laughs> so that that's an education conservative. Um, I am actually quite socially conservative at this point. That's an old statement. I don't know who made that Wikipedia page, <laughs> but uh, I, I become quite socially conservative and religiously conservative as well in in the last few years. And one reason for that is that I see where political liberalism, social liberalism has gone in the last few years. It has gone deeply into identity politics. It has become highly illiberal. (laughs) And my feeling is that this is not an abandonment of liberalism it is, in fact, the logical extension of liberalism, that we were never going to stay with Martin Luther King's colorblind vision of universal humanity, all of us equal in the eyes of God. Nope, we were going to break up into identities. It, it, was, it was going to, the temptation would have been too strong. And liberalism had undermined the institutions that kept us from doing in that, such as churches. Right, uh, that liberalism had uh, set about in one way or another to make the family a more fragile social unit with policies such as no-fault divorce. And the fact is that when you have children who grow up in stable families, they're not going to be the ones who take quick offense at things. Children who grow up in strong families with fathers around young men are not going to uh, they're, they're not going to be so fragile and and resentful over what other people say and do. They've got a stronger constitution. They can handle things more. It's kids who come from brittle families that they're particularly inclined toward illiberal behavior. So this is one reason why I've become much more socially and religiously conservative in recent years. And also I see liberalism has become not uh, the freedom of the individual to stand firm against blunt authorities and dead traditions and conformity. It is it has become a hammer to coerce people to get in line with all the politically correct outlooks. That's where where liberalism has gone in two thousand seventeen. I suppose it depends on what you mean by the word liberal. I mean, I don't see how you can argue with the fact that uh, single motherhood is the greatest single predictor of intergenerational poverty. That's a fact. Um, and and then what do you have demographic-wise? You have the the black single mother rate is over 70%. The Hispanic uh, single mother rate is over 50%. And the white uh, single motherhood rate is somewhere over 30%. We're in trouble, aren't we? The problem with talking about that is that feminism will not allow it. Feminism does not want to say that single mothers are 
uh, inadequate. Uh, remember that liber this is where liberalism really has become an outlook for the top 20%. If you are in the top 20%, by far you tend to form stable families, you don't get divorced, you do get married before you have kids, and you have all the habits of delayed gratification and work ethic that lead to success in, in college and in America today. You can exercise enough prudence on your own so that the impact of the sexual revolution doesn't hit you so hard. You protect yourself better. Well, the bottom half of America doesn't. The sexual revolution was very good for upper middle class women who wanted to have careers. It's very good for them. The sexual revolution has been a disaster for working class and underclass women. Would anyone doubt that? Can no, not, not, not even the Brookings Institute, the left-leaning institute. They said that oh. if you want to avoid permanent poverty in the United States, you had to do three things. You had to not have kids out of wedlock, um, get a job, and um, uh, graduate high school. <laughs> but look, liberals who occupy that top 20%, they have to deny it because it's worked for them. It's been very good for them. They can be professionals, you know, mother and father, they both work, they, they have good jobs, they raise their kids in careful ways, they, they raise their kids with bourgeois norms, <laughs> um, but they refuse to uh, present their own lives as examples for everyone else to follow. They will not say that it is very bad that 17-year-old black men have no fathers around to teach them how to be grown-ups. They'll think it. They'll say it privately, but they will not say it publicly. They know that the riots in Baltimore were the result of social pathologies in that area, not of racism. But how could it, how could it be racism? The you know the the wasn't the the black, the city council a majority black the police force majority minority in that case the the uh, the mayor wasn't the mayor black and 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 the you know and, the, and, and there have been hundreds of millions of dollars poured into that area in government programs in the last thirty years and yet the Obama administration spoke about this and there's a lack of access and opportunity. I mean, they were speaking as if they were still in 1971. Uh, so they, they, Jordan, they can't give up that 1970s liberal outlook on social issues, the sexual revolution, uh, and, and, and so on, because their, their entire position would collapse. I mean, their t entire personal position would collapse along with their political philosophy. They would have to admit, yeah, it's been very good for me. And that's not what a liberal wants to say. A liberal wants to believe I'm thinking of others, <laughs> not myself. <laughs> so it, it's, it's something they will never admit. So it seems like a lot of your political consciousness has evolved along with your religious uh, evolution. I wanted to ask you, you were, you were an atheist for most of your life, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I want to know what motivated your shift um, uh, and your, your religious identity, and was it a, was it a transcendent well, uh, I, I, experience? Was it a question of lack of meaning? Was it an intellectual development? What, what led to your uh, move towards religion? Well, I, I was I was born baptized Catholic, uh, but you know had my had my uh, my atheist conversion as a late teenager, and stuck with that for a long time. I don't think that people go through two conversions. I think that's pretty much impossible. So I went through one, 
and that was my conversion to atheism. And it, it hit me within a few minutes, uh, that experience. Uh, the return to the church uh, to faith really was a slow realization in middle age that there was something wrong with my atheism, that it actually was more of a psychological response to my circumstances as a teenager than it was a, a genuine revelation of the truth of things. That, in combination with having a son, having a family, and thinking to myself, I don't want him to think of, uh, of the world as absent God. And not because it will make him feel better, but because I just felt deep down there's something wrong here. Now, he can make up his own mind when he's 18, but he's going to go to church until then. And he takes to it quite naturally. And I do think that children uh, accept very easily on faith the, the presence of God. It's so easy for them. And I, I find a wisdom in that. It sounds to me a little bit, I'm going to challenge you here, push back a little bit, it sounds a little bit like argument from consequence, the fallacy, where if I don't like the, if I don't like the outcome of something, therefore, it's not true. Um, or if I don't like the outcome of something, therefore, it is true. Either that or Pascal's wager. Um, explain to me how it's not. I, I, I would, I, I mean, it may be a fallacy of of consequence, um, but I, 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 I would say that the consequences of a belief, uh, that if, if you are troubled by the consequences of a belief, that that is worth taking into account in, when we're talking about metaphysical matters, not empirical matters, right? We have to follow the facts, mm -hmm. the information, mm -hmm. the data, the evidence. Yeah. Uh, but in metaphysical matters, when uh, we're always going to be seeing through a glass darkly, that the, the consequences and the different kinds of consequences are, are actually uh, somewhat valid. I mean, in a way, it's, it's like the, the, the cosmopolitan atheist, the sophisticated, learned figure who isn't anti-religion, he just simply believes that it's not true, but who thinks that religion is good for civilization, <laughs> religion's good for society. Now, they would say that there would be an example of consequentialism that would have a degree of cynicism in it, although they would really believe that it is good. That's me, by society. the way, that's me. I, okay, okay. Uh, I, I would say that they in this case, don't give the consequences their full due. That there may be something more about why mm. religion is good for people and good for society. Mm. But I don't, I don't pretend to make strong philosophical arguments about, mm. ab about this. And, and I, I, I somewhat want to leave it alone in, 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 my, in, my, in my own head. Um, because I know that my instinct going back to this this atheist conversion is is to tear it all down and i still have that inside me uh those 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 doubting voices and i don't want to listen to them i think they're wrong even though they're there i believe they're wrong so i i have a certain mistrust for for my own uh my my, my own my own deep psychic disposition <laughs> things. So how has your life changed since this conversion? I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this. How has it changed how you see the world? How has it changed maybe the way that you parent? Uh, well, one, I, I think that when you settle into this kind of thing, you, you acquire a certain degree of moral courage, right? I'm not afraid to stand up for what I think is right, even though it usually means being outnumbered and despised. I mean, I, I get you know the 
periodic hate mail for things I write. Mm. But doesn't matter. I'm going to maintain uh, what, what I'm doing. Um, so that's one thing that comes with it. Um, another thing is the maybe you 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 feel a little more a stronger feel for the past and the future, not just the present. Uh, where you you do slip more easily into that famous contract that Edmund Burke talked about, where we owe a debt to the past and we we must pass the past on to the future as well through our kids, through our work. Um, that you have you have more consciousness of things that lie outside the present. This is the 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 other thing that I would say, and there 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 is a a certain groundedness mm. that you have when you go to church every week and you you have your rosary with you. There is a, a place to go that is out of the world. And that I find pleasing. Hmm. It's nice to leave the world once in a while. <laughs> As a lover of literature, I can attest that that is true. <laughs> um, I want to switch over to the dumbest generation for a little bit. Uh, in the book, you argue against those who would claim that the internet is a panacea for young people. You argue that while the internet is the greatest storehouse of knowledge in human history, I saw this in your uh, Phi Beta Kappa uh, video, Students aren't using the internet this way. They, they aren't using the internet this way, uh, contrary to what uh, uh, the, the technocrats would claim. For the most part, they're not, as your critics would make it seem, sitting at home examining old maps and documents and going to the National Geographic website, or they're not on their iPhones at Starbucks browsing through documents or museum collections. They're basically using social media. They're just talking to other young people. Um, now, I assume that since you wrote the book, the frequency of internet usage has increased. Um, but has the tendency changed? Are, are, are kids going on the internet and using social media? Or, or has there been some, some movement there? Are kids spending their time on the Smithsonian or uh, PBS websites? Has any of that changed? It doesn't seem to me to be so. I'm with kids every day. The, the, no, the movement has changed. It's gotten much worse. Uh, we have more social media now than we did in 2008. Twitter was just starting uh, about when I was writing that book. Facebook had only been it, it had really it had really launched what in 06 it really started to to spread. Uh, so the social media is is much broader than than it is now. There was no Instagram or Snapchat uh, back then, um, but this was inevitable. What do, what do teenagers care about? They care about other teenagers. They care about what other teenagers want to look at. So they've got celebrity sites and, and, and pop music and youth culture through, uh, th through the social media and sharing among themselves. It's a peer pressure medium for, for them. They, the, the intellectual impact is clear. They are writing more words than ever before. Mm -hmm. Has, has writing improved among young people? Well, the SAT added a writing exam, in, uh, a writing component, in 2006, and scores have gone down every year except two years when they were flat. Uh, reading scores on the SAT are at their lowest in 40 years. Uh, we haven't had any bump in reading on the NAEP exams, in spite of the millions and millions and millions of dollars that have been poured into reading instruction after No Child Left Behind in particular. And we don't see any gains on the NAEP scores in civics and U.S. history. I mean, they're, 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 they're not more knowledgeable than they, than they were before. We see no intellectual gain at all from the digital age. It hasn't happened, and the good thing is no one is claiming it anymore. They were, the, the, the hype was very powerful in 2000, 2001, 2003. No one is hyping this anymore as, as the digital age bringing an extraordinary flowering of intellectualism and knowledge among, among the rising generations. That's over. 
and 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 it's a relief at least that we don't have to listen to that. No, but you do hear them say, "Look, IQs have been going up, and and besides, uh, these young people." They're not the dumbest generation. They're just uh, applying their intelligence to different problems and exercising their faculties through different channels. And they're they're right. the most tech savvy generation, and they're changing the economy. And they they may not know the facts that you and I want them to know, but but they have other skills. They're they're great at multitasking, and they're forward looking, and their facility with social media is is uh, is bringing about limitless potential. It's connecting the world. What do you say to to these people? Make this well, well for, first, the, the, the rising IQ scores, that phenomenon that ran through the, the 20th century, uh, that looks like I've seen recent reports that that's, that's slowed down quite a bit. Also, uh, in areas of IQ that are measured, you know, IQ scores are composites of nine or ten tests. One of them is vocabulary. We've had very little gain in vocabulary uh, apart from more people going to college. That has improved vocabulary. That wasn't the internet. Certainly didn't didn't do that. Uh, do, does anyone think that the comment rolls and Facebook pages have high vocabulary? Anyone's going to learn anything from those? No, not not at all. Um, information IQ. That is how much you know about the world. That's barely budged. Uh, so the more culture heavy the iq test I and mean, the less abstract you know like uh, the abstract reasoning spatial reasoning and things like that uh the less we see any any iq gains so people don't have any more knowledge than they did before to to speak of where they have done is they because more schooling they have gotten better at abstract problem solving so they're more accustomed to the kinds of uh, abstract challenges that IQ tests pose. That's where that's really where the gains uh, come from. Now, they're going to college more than they did before. They're getting more degrees than ever before. But whenever we have tests of actual knowledge and thinking development, boy, are the results disappointing. First of all, grade inflation. In 1960, only 15% of college grades were A's. Today, it's 45%. Now, do, do we really think the college students are, you know, that much smarter than they were back in that? No, the scale has changed. We've raised the, the uh, or we've lowered the bar, I should say, than much, much more than we did before. Uh, when they look at how much critical thinking, problem-solving gains happen from freshman year to to graduation it's very disappointing this was the topic of the big 2011 book academically adrift which so that some one-third of students make hardly any gains from freshman year to senior year uh the, the the most of them don't don't make any significant gains beyond that uh when, when they do get some gain it's 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 very little and boy they're paying a lot of money for it and then ask employers about college graduates, and they're going to start screaming about how poor their verbal communication skills are, their writing skills, their reading skills, and not to mention their soft skills of uh, how to conduct themselves mm. in, in the workplace. You know, the, 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 the numbers aren't there. Now, people don't like to say that because they don't want to criticize the kids. They don't want to sound like a grouchy old man. They don't want to make judgments about our culture, our society, and so they they put on the rose-colored glasses, but they're wrong. But we need to be the grown-ups. We uh, go ahead and say I'm a curmudgeon, but we need to be the grown-ups. Sorry, kids want us, to, and they want us to be grown-ups. They do. They want to hear the truth. I mean, at least give them something meaningful to rebel against <laughs> instead of this uh, soft and, you know, I love the kids, you know. they I, 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 I really learn more from them than they learn from me. Oh, please, if that's the case, then you shouldn't be paid. <laughs> um, uh, you, you shouldn't be at the podium. Um, uh, one, one of the things that surprised I, me... I, I actually think that they are starved for... Uh, teachers and mentors who can be a little more stern with them and tell them the truth. I think so too. And I work in an urban district uh, at an urban high school and 
you know, my, my colleagues, I think, view me as, as one of the stricter teachers, and I, and I say, I think that's what they're craving. They're not, they're not, yes. get, they're not getting the structure at home. They're not, they don't have anyone at home to correct their grammar. They don't have anyone at home to, to show them culturally important works or works of, of real value. They don't have anyone at home to speak with some sort of intellectual authority to them. I feel like I'm doing a service. You are. <laughs> you are. I mean, for, for some of them, I imagine this is the only place in their lives where they have some some rational, predictable challenge and support. I mean, maybe this is the only place where they, they, they can escape a lot of emotional chaos at home. That happens. Uh, so you are, they, they want you to be this. This is what I, what, I, what I assume. I do too. I do think that they're open to this, and maybe a lot of it has to do with the idea of age segregation. I saw that you did a TED Talk on this, and I'm going to give you a quote by Senator Ben Sass. I read his book, The Vanishing American Adult, and it was very good. I don't know if you read it. Um, he, he gets was, it right. Yeah. He gets things right. Uh, he was yeah. talking with Peter Robinson uh, from, I think it's Uncommon Knowledge, and he said this, and he, and he wrote this in his book too, we're raising 15-year-olds that spend almost all of their time with 15-year-olds and 19-year-olds that spend almost all of their time with 19-year-olds. That's really weird, historically. Nobody has ever done that before. He says, basically, that if you brought people in a time machine from 300 years ago to 3,000 years ago, anyone in that range, and drop them into today, one of the main things they'd think is really strange is that we live almost entirely age-segregated lives. So what accounts for this age segregation? Why is it happening? And what are its consequences? Yeah, it, it actually goes back before the digital age, but the digital age has certainly amplified uh, the age segregation factor. Now... When I grew up, still, yeah, the kids would hang out in the neighborhood, and you get some vast, you know, five, six, seven year age differences, and that actually was a good thing uh, to relate to people of different age groups from from yourself. When it's only your own age group, there's this there's this kind of false equality uh, that that you can have, and it doesn't teach you things. If you if you're 12 and you're playing with an eight year old, you have to be a little more responsible. If you're 12 and you're playing with a 15-year-old, you have to try to act a little older than you are. This is good. This helps you. Both cases help you mature. If 12-year-olds are just with 12-year-olds, you can just be exactly what you are and not worry about it, not think about it, uh, not feel you have to take care of someone else or that you have to obey someone else. And, and I think that that, that uh, does hinder the development of maturity is social media at fault. I mean, you you can't it help helps. you can't help but blame social media when when they come home and it maybe uh, f- formerly it had been the case that kids would have to hang out with their parents or or right. they would go in their rooms and read a book. Now they're going on social media, even when right. they're around their parents, they're using social media while their parents are talking to them. Is it goes media on all, all day, all day and all night. It it goes on. I mean, they they, they run about thirty five hundred text messages a month, you know, to go along with all the other, all the other social media uh, stuff. And it does allow them to really age segregate. I mean, really year. I mean, only one or two years difference now between uh, between groups. Uh, and again, this. Uh, is a it's it's a failure to form a more diverse set of relationships that would help you help you to grow up it also separates you from adults in ways that was never true uh, in in the past this is a great social experiment of kids growing up with more influence from one another than from from any adults in their lives All right, so that's our show. I'd like to say a special thanks to Mark Bauerlein, Spencer Clavin, and Gina Santiago. For next month, we're finalizing plans to have on a well-known guest to talk about Homer's Odyssey. More on that soon. 
And we'll be speaking with philosopher Stephen Hicks next episode. He is the author of Explaining Postmodernism. I'm Jordan Alexander-Hill, and thanks for listening to the Western Canon Podcast. And happy reading. Happy reading.